84 season. By July, Dale was getting frustrated. He come close to putting his number three in victory lane, but was still winless. Something happened to the engine, I'm not sure why, but you know, that about put us out of the points there, but we're gonna try to come back and win the rest of the race. Hello everyone and welcome to NASCAR Classics and the 1984 Talladega 500. Not only was Dale still winless as the second half of the season got underway, there were whispers that Dale was driving conservative. To the intimidator, those were fighting words. Earnhardt had never stroked in his career and didn't consider four second place finishes and leading the championship points as stroking. We were still building and we didn't have the, the backing and the money and the finances that the Junior Johnsons and the Bud Moores and the people that we were racing had, but throughout the year, from 81 to that point, we had built, and we really built a strong program, and, and Dale, even then, and even in the late 70s, watching him run a race at Daytona, race against him, uh, 79, I think it was, and, and 80 when he won his championship, he knew how to get around Daytona and Talladega like no one else. Nothing was more unbeatable than an extremely motivated Dale Earnhardt. Dale would start his three car in the third spot, while Cale Yarbrough would be on the pole. When we return, we'll drop the green flag in the 1984 Talladega 500. The starting lineup for the 1984 Talladega 500. The front row. Cale Yarborough and Bill Elliott both qualifying at over 202 miles an hour and breaking the old Talladega record. A Chevrolet and a Ford. Row two is Dale Earnhardt, the 1983 winner, and Texas Terry Labonte. He's currently third in the Grand National standings. Row three is Tommy Ellis, the real dark horse in this race from Virginia, car four, and beside him comes Buddy Baker, who won in 1975. Going to row four, the two-time winner of the event, it's Darrell Waltrip in car 11, and beside him, Neil Bonnet, who pulled it off in 1980. Row five is Ron Bouchard, who had that tremendous win here in 81, and Rusty Wallace. Going to row six, Richard Petty, who won it back in 1974, and Dave Marcus, the 76 winner. In row seven, it's Jody Ridley, and Harry Gant, fresh from his win at Pocono. In row eight, Lake Speed from Mississippi, and Bobby Allison, who won this race. In row nine, Phil Parsons, and beside him, Richard Brooks, also a previous winner in 73. Row 10 is the all-time great. A.J. Foyt is back and looking strong in the Dick Hutcherson car and Sterling Marlin. Row 11 is Phil Buckdahl, new name from Iowa, and Greg Sachs from New York. Going to row 12, Tim Richmond is there in car 27, and Ricky Rudd at the Ford number 15. Row 13 is the Chrysler of Buddy Arrington and Kyle Petty's Ford. Row 14, Joe Rutman from California, and Jeff Bodine, who's won twice on the short tracks this year. Row 15 is Trevor Boyce from Canada, and former Rookie of the Year, Ronnie Thomas. Row 16, Grant Adcox, ready to settle down, and Bobby Hillen from Texas. Harvard in row 17 is Mike Alexander from Tennessee, and Randy Baker. In row 18, it's Ken Reagan, the Georgia driver, and Morgan Shepard in car 52. Row 19 is Colorado's Clark Dwyer and Eddie Durswell from Texas. In row 20, Elliott Forbes Robinson and Steve Moore round out the field for this Talladega 500. There you see the safety car coming in. The crowd cheering them down for a start. Responsive congregation here in Alabama to see another one of these great spectacles in the most competitive automobile racing in the world. Coming to the line, you're with Bill Elliott coming down. There you see Kelly Arbor on the inside, edging the familiar Harry Rainier car out in front of there, over the line and underway. 188 laps in the 16th annual, near half million dollar Talladega 500. Yarborough for the lead in the early going. It shows how strong the engine is in that car again on the acceleration. He just moved right away from Bill Elliott, Dale Earnhardt, and a Chevrolet followed right on the back bumper off Dale Yarborough. Greg Sachs was ready to fire, and he came into the event. Back straight away, first time. And there's that number three. That is Earnhardt, last year's winner, trying to be the first man to win two in a row. And Tommy Ellis, Tommy Ellis out of Virginia, moving up in there, going for second place. Had to be a great moment for him if he drafted by Dale Yarborough. Fourth place now, remember, Tommy Ellis, relative newcomer. See most of his Grand National experience all this year. But don't forget, he had a fourth place finish.
the National 500 at Charlotte a few years back. Ellis now in second place. Bernhardt trying to be the first man to win this race back to back two years in a row. In turn number two, Ellison with second spot trying to be one of those dark horses to pull it out. Will it be a different winner this year? About 15 cars have pulled away from the balance of the pack back there, Ken. But these cars are so evenly matched with this heading coming up on the inside, right behind Ron Bouchard. In the six, Ryan for fifth. Tremendous shuffle of automobiles down into turn number three. Earnhardt stays on the point. And Tommy Ellis, the man they used to call Terrible Tommy, just an incredible racer, holding on the former national champion. He could be the scourge of Grand National Racing, 36 years old, the new team. We'll tell you more about it as the day progresses. Here he comes. Three wide down to the fly oval. Across the line. That staccato roar of automobiles as they snap by. Our high speed camera here. Earnhardt was very quick to move to the lead. There's five bonus points. And here goes Bill Elliott. Bill Elliott on the inside of Tommy Ellis. But those five bonus points with Earnhardt leading them going into this race game can be very important. Kelly Yarbrough also moving by on the high side as Ellis gets right back in there again. Now, Ellis is driving for the same team that won this race with Lenny Pond a few years ago, and he is showing just absolute determination. For a guy who cut his teeth against Sonny Hutchins and the likes of those short tracks in Virginia, look at how Ellis is performing here today as he pulls up at the second spot and keeps Taylor Yarbrough back in third. He has to give great hope to the short track racers around the country, Ken. And many of them have raced with this fellow on the Saturday night, and now they see him up here running with the best in the world and say, hey, maybe it's not as hard as we think. Now, no, to run. Bouchard is getting into it as well. Car number 47 with a new crew chief here for today's race. A new look on the BB team. And Ron Bouchard, who won it in 1981 and had three of rest finish, back straight away. Here comes the tail. He goes after the number three car of Earnhardt, the yellow and blue car. Earnhardt, Richard Children, just away, getting past the turn number three. Bottom of the track. Tail Yarbrough in front and Terry Labonte. Number 44, the Billy Hagan entry. That car chaperoned to the shop by Dale Inman now in the second place and looking very stout through all the qualifying and practice period thus far. And the car has also looked very strong in recent races. He's been in the picture of the photo finishes in several the events here at Talladega. He knows how to drive this racetrack. Dale Inman knows how to set the car up to make it go fast. Four laps have been complete. Just an explosive start to this event as they swap the lead back and forth. Remember, the record. Now here's Bodine cutting through cars. That is Kyle Petty in the number seven car. Ricky Rudd in the fifth and A.J. Boyd in 14, the red car in the back stretch. Here comes Kyle Petty down the inside. Big problems with that team these days. More about that story later in today's live coverage of the Talladega 500. Back with the leaders another time. Yarborough deployed first in the second spot in Levante. As they come out of turn number four, Earnhardt is still maintaining third. Coming around to complete five laps in the tri-oval. And Buddy Baker has moved up there in fourth place. He is one of the big winners here at Talladega. He loves this racetrack and the high speed they run here. Baker is in fourth and his five car lengths back. In fifth is Ron Bouchard and Ellis has fallen to sixth. But he's not falling much further back than that. And now Bouchard is closing up. You're back with Bill Elliott as he skips through traffic another time. Bill Elliott who won at Riverside, California, the last race of last year and won at Michigan this year. Here he is right behind Tommy Ellis, darting down into turn number three, up on the 33-degree banking. Pulls about a G and a half right here. Ken, there's lots of racing room. You can see Ellis move to the inside of the track where Bill Elliott is staying high, along with Dale Yarber in the car number 28. Look at Ellis get in there and, and, and shuffle it with these fellows. That's the car number four. Ellis is in on the inside. It's interesting how we see those cars just bobbling a little bit. It's almost impossible to keep the cars in a straight line when they're running in a draft. They're running against the wall of air right on each side. Now, they're running at just about 200 miles an hour, and you're riding right around this track with Bill Elliott. This incredible speed, inches apart. Bodine, who started in the 28th position, is now up to 19. Bodine, at number 28, is on the charge and cutting through traffic. Now you're back with Richard Petty. There may be a windshield crack in the bottom of Richard Petty's windshield. Car number 43. Yes, it does look there is some crack there again, and that could be trouble for him later on. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on the windshield at the speed they run here. As they come down, that might be part of the coating they put on the windshield, but it sure looked like a crack. Back in front of those car three, it is children, or rather the children's car with Earnhardt aboard in that front running position. Number eight, and the shuffle continues. You see those cars take a set 
and then move over three or four feet, just as if someone lifted them up and sent them over. The air circulation will cause that. Now here's Buddy Baker going for the lead. He's a charger, putting his board right out in front around Dale Earnhardt. Down on the inside, Baker, another previous winner of this event, goes to the lead. It's Baker out in front. Earnhardt stays in second. And the third place barber is that number 44, the white and blue colors. Terry Labonte. But Bouchard is on the inside and trying to close. As they come to the tri oval, it's Bouchard on the bottom of the track. He wants a peak at first place. He has a new crew chief on his car, Wayne Bumgarner, who was with the Diagard team that Bobby Allison drives for, is now the crew chief on the car number 47. And we have seen the results in just in the last two weeks. He has really made the car help to put it up front. That's the blue car on the bottom side fighting for third right now. The man who won it in 81, he's falling back just a bit to Labonte and coming back is Taylor Yarbrough the fourth. Bouchard falling to fifth. Let's get a word for Betty Parsons for just a moment. Your opinion of these first eight, nine laps. I tell you what, the first 15 cars did break away from the back cars, but the second, 10, the second pack of 10 cars caught up again. We now have a 25-car draft. And as you see the Ron Bouchard and Bill Elliott, when they try to go to the inside of the racetrack, they have lots of problems. That is not the fast way around right now. And why? Well, because as you come off the turn, the car does not accelerate. You bog the car down, or as you come up out of the turn, it takes a lot of horsepower. And up high of the racetrack, you don't use as much horsepower. And last year, we had a record 75 lead changes in this race. In the first nine laps, there have already been six lead changes. Down they come in the front straightaway. Out in front goes Labonte in the 44. Labonte trying for that lead and back on the outside again comes number three, Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt right back there in that Richard Childress car. What a job that Childress crew has done this year. He is the former driver himself, but he knows what it takes to make a fast race car. When he was driving, he didn't have the sponsorship that bucks behind him to help him run in a first-class manner. He has that now and is proving his ability. Just fantastic racing. Wouldn't you agree, Benny Parsons? It is. It's great racing. I'm impressed. I'm, you know, I'd rather see a race like this from up here than down inside the car. It's really? too nerve-wracking. Benny, sometimes we'll see a car, we see the body down on the inside, which, as you say, is not the place to be because we're going to see Elliot pull right up on the outside of it in the draft of Hale Yarborough. But it looks like when we see one just zip by another one that he's generated 100 horsepower. It looks easy, but it really isn't. It that really easy. is not that easy. You've got to have everything just right to go by with that surge of speed, man. Down to the inside, Bouchard knocking off one, knocking off two, the number 47 car getting by Elliott, pulling up again, trying to move in, and losing some ground another time as they come through the tri-oval. Down to the start finish line. It's interesting how we saw him pull up there. He had the momentum going. He had picked up the draft of cars in front of him, but once he got up there to them, hit that wall of air, then we saw him start going backwards. He's down on the inside once again, but it's awfully tough to make a strong run from that. From Richard Petty's car, looking out the back, and right behind him comes Allison. That is Allison right there. And on the inside, you see one of Neil the Junior Bonnet. Johnson cars, Neil Bonnet. Last lap on the leaders was turned at 198.2. 198.2. We are now working the 12th lap. Well, A.J. Foyt's not running too well at this point, Ken. He's uh, back in 25th position, running by himself on the racetrack, an indication that his car is not handling when he gets in the heavy track. Bill Elliott is running in fifth. Richard Petty pulls himself up into the sixth position. Let's go to Chris Economacki with the story on pit road. I'm with Glenn Wood, who's Buddy Baker's car. Glenn, some of the laps have been over 200 miles an hour. It's early in the race. Can these engines stand this? For 500 miles. Well, that gear is old enough to stand. It should be. Uh, they'll turn in the neighborhood of uh, 75, 7800, and uh, they'll be up and down a little bit, but uh, the speed should be uh, in the range with the gear. You're not worried about it? No. Okay, 200 miles an hour, just another day of the race. Back to you, Ken. Ken, when he said that he had a tall enough gear, that means he has a high gear ratio. Benny, approximately what do they run in these cars now? Well, the cars today will be running a 3.15 to 1 or a 3.25, which means that the engine turns 3.25 times to the rear wheel turning once. And that, is, in comparison to a street car, is uh, about the same ratio? About the same as a street car, right. Uh, some of the street cars today have 2.7 to 2.8, but uh, 10 years ago. First 10 laps. 
lap. Run at a record 197.443 miles an hour. Back with more live coverage of the Talladega 500 after this word from your local station. Caution after a blown engine for Randy Baker. Let's take a look at replay of what we saw just a few moments ago out here on Pitt Road. A Benny Parsons, that looks like a very busy supermarket on Saturday morning. Can you imagine that? And, you know, how do you get any reason out of that chaos that you're seeing there? Your tires is every place. And Phil, my brother, is right in the middle of the screen right now. He backs up and, and then tries to go. And I think he's loved. He's having a problem with something. That's a live picture we're seeing. He's out of the race again. Oh, that's too bad. Running for Rookie of the Year, Phil Parsons, car number 66, having a problem here. He's been in a pretty good squabble with uh, Rusty Wallace, and, and now Tommy Ellis is running for Rookie of the Year, really getting into it with the McClure car. They have some excellent rookies this year, probably the best crop of rookies they've had in a long time. Benny, does it look that way from the inside of the automobile when you're on pit road? Oh, it does. You, can't, you get in there and somebody pulls in front of you, you can't get out, or if you're the last one to, to come down pit road, then you can't get in. And, and it seems like an eternity. It seems like an eternity. There's tires, as we noticed a moment ago, on that shot, there's tires laying all in pit road, which is, you got to dodge. It's like going to the supermarket and the light poles, you got to dodge to get in and out. Uh, and the carts. And the carts, right. 19 laps complete this time by 50 and a half miles will have been completed in our 500 mile test today on the NASCAR Grand National Tour. Joe Ruttman had a problem in the pits again. He had the hood up on his car number 98. He had charged up towards the front and was in that lead pack of cars, but he now has gone the lap down, and Phil Parsons, as we see his car being pushed into the garage area, Mike Joy. Mike Joy was there. That car has lost its drive shaft, Ned, They're and the rear end, they may have a problem there as well. They're going to fix it and get Phil back in the race for rookie points. Let's see if we can get a word of Jeff Bodine here. Jeff Bodine, you came from 28 up to 11. Looks like that car is really hitched up today, Jeff. It is, Ken. It's handling real good. Uh, we got up on the outside groove and, and uh, seemed to come to the front pretty fast. We can maintain that all day. We'll be in good shape here. I want to say hi to my boys, Matt and Barry. They're back home. They want to be race car, car drivers someday. Now they can look and see what their father has to go through every week. <laughs> Jeff, this is Ned Jarrett. That fellow right in front of you, Kyle Petty, was coming up through the field with you. Yeah, Kyle's running good. Uh, Neil Binder, uh, yeah, Tim Richmond and Joe Ruffin, we're, we're all running good. Uh, we get work together here and just kind of, you got to pick off uh, these guys in front of you one at a time. It's hard to take a bunch at a time. Just take one at a time. Which we can do that. We should be able to get to the front here in this next uh, period. Good luck to you, Jeff. Now we're going to the pit area. Here's Chris Economaki. All, of, all kinds of excitement down here. Trouble with the cars, and one of Joe Rutman's pit men splashed some fluid in his face. He's getting his eyes washed out. Rutman's car broke a distributor. We've had windshields cracking, drive shafts going bad, distributors breaking, and the race is only 50 miles old. It's going to be one of those days, I think. Back to you, Ken. Ken, on the drive shaft situation, Benny is on a track like this with the high gearing. Sometimes it's awfully easy when you let that jack down, maybe to accelerate too quick, which can get a transmission, an axle, or a drive shaft. Well, it is, and the clutch that we use on these race cars today is a very small unit and it has a metallic disc and it is so responsive that it's either in or out and these they will not take when you let the clutch out here the clutch engages so fast it will just pop a drive shaft out four cars have retired from the event grant edcox is out ronnie thomas from virginia has retired randy baker as you just saw phil parsons they have out but we believe he's going to try to make an effort to get back in the event 40 cars starting the event this afternoon, and 20 laps will be complete when they come by this time. They are now estimating attendance at some 94,000 for this race. The leader is that car number 17 that's now pitting, and that is Clark Wire, the 20-year-old driver from Colorado Springs, Colorado, in the Roger Hamby car. But now he comes into the pit, and let's go to the pit with Mike Joy. I'm with Dick Hutcherson, co-crew chief for A.J. Boyd. A.J.'s been running along in the middle of the pack. Is he just feeling things out, or is the car okay? Well, we're just letting the cars get strung out a little bit. He said everything feels perfect, and um, we had a good pit stop then. We'll see if we can't stay up there now. When you're running a series against fellas who drive this circuit 30 times a year, is it tough to come in and just run four or five races and keep up on all the innovations? You're right. When you come down here and run NASCAR, you better bring your lunch, because it's an all-day job to beat this guy. Good luck today. Hey, AJ. Back upstairs. There is A.J. Foyt getting set for the start. 
car number 14. That fellow that uh, Dick Hutcherson that Mike Joy was talking to was a pretty fair chauffeur himself, Ken. He came from you Iowa. You were with him a few oh, times. Oh, boy, many times. In fact, I believe he's the best dirt track racer that I ever ran against in stock cars. Dick Hutcherson. Now, car number four, originally out of Keokuk, wasn't he? Was he yes, another he was. one of those Keokuk and stars? I, I think that the state of Iowa has more racetracks than any other state in the union, and they're all dirt. So they got some good experience there. 20 laps are now complete, 53 and two-tenths of a mile. 13 lead changes in 20 laps among seven drivers have been recorded thus far in our CBS Live flight to flight coverage of the 16th annual Talladega 500. Now, as we line up, Bobby Allison is on the point. Neil Bonnet is in second. Dale Earnhardt is in third. Richard Petty is in fourth. All four previous winners of this event. There's Terry Labonte lying fifth. Lap cars down on the inside as we get ready. Sterling Marlins, number 95, out of the track. And with him comes Joe Rutland, a lap down. How does that work on a restart, Benny Parsons? With those lap cars down, it really gives you a chance to tighten up and go for it. Well, it gives you a chance to get that lap back. Like Joe Rutland, his car is as good as any car here, but yet he had a distributor problem. He's now a lap down. Under the rules, he's able to pull down on the inside and race with the leaders and, if possible, get in front of the leaders to get the caution flag, and, and therefore he can make up a lap. Start watching the restart from Richard Petty in fourth place. Six is Kale. Seventh right now is the Melling car, Bill Elliott. Going eighth on the restart is Buddy Baker. In the ninth position is Mike Alexander. Greg Sachs is in tenth as they come back to the line. Running eleventh is Tim Richmond. Twelfth is Bouchard. In the thirteenth position is Kyle Petty. And in fourteenth, that car number five of Jeff Bodine. And they're immediately going to work and getting around Sterling Marlin is Joe Rutman. He wants that lap back. He's had a lot of misfortune this year. And a very good race driver. Richard Petty tagging right along with him as they hit the back straight away. You are with Richard Petty. Going for his 201st victory here today at the world's fastest racing oval. They're the leaders. As they swap them around up in front, it is now Bonnet to lead. And dropping into that second spot comes the Dale Earnhardt team. Boy, look at that car settle as it goes over some of the rough part of the track. Earnhardt car looks very strong in the early going here. Of course, they qualified in the third position. And uh, it, to me, Ben, it looks as strong as I've seen it on Super Speedway, even though he ran second in the Daytona 500 this year. Allison back on the he inside. He today that he has been, Ben, you're right. Allison back on the inside, number 22. Right back in there, thrusting that car by three machines as they come out of turn number two. Bobby Allison knocks on the door another time. And the fans here are just loving it because Bobby Allison and Neil Bynes, the two cars that side by side with Neil Bynes, are only 50 miles from here. Huey's down Alabama, and they got a lot of fans here today, kid. Alabama gang going for it, and here comes Elliott mixing it up now. He's right up there, inches away from Bobby Allison's car at over 195 miles an hour. And they just sashay a little off turn number four. Absolutely amazing at how close they can run together. When President Reagan was at Firecracker 400 a few weeks ago, he was awed by the fact that they could run that close together at speeds of upwards of 200 miles an hour. All right, the Talladega Freight, the Talladega Express, wheels down out of the trial. Just an incredibly fantastic competitive race here this afternoon on CBS from the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Bill Elliott goes back on the inside, and Allison tries to work high on the back straightaway. There you see Petty lying third, actually lying third, because 98 is a lap car. And now Rutman has worked his way up there right behind Dale Earnhardt, so he's in position if another caution should come out to get back in the lead lane. They really rocket off turn number four, and you can see those cars taking that set, getting bounced around as they come through there, and this tremendous grab. Benny Parsons, you get actually lifted out there, and it looks like those cars are floating. They do. The car just, they don't really float, but they move around. There is so much air currents caused by the other cars, it just simply moves you around. There's nothing you can do. And you know the thing that I want to impress upon these fans watching today again, is these cars are literally, they are actually running 200 miles an hour, bumper to bumper and side by side. 3,700 pound cars. There goes Kale on the outside. He is strong also, no surprise though, at 202 miles an hour qualifying. Moves right up on the outside of Joe Rutman and Petty coming right with him too. In the draft, Bobby Allison right behind Petty. Darrell Walker back 28th on the restart. And he's trying to move his, well look at Yarborough just explode out from behind, drops to the bottom of the track, and in the trioval it is Cale Yarborough who has never won this race. He's won 81 Grand National races, but never.
ever this one. Many horses, there are not many racetracks that you can make that kind of a radical move at the speeds that they're running. No, I tell you what, this racetrack is very forgiving for the, as fast as you do run. It really is. But also, when you have trouble, you hit hard as hard here as any racetrack on the circuit. Benny Parsons can attest to that, crashing at some 190 miles per hour. What a testimony to the way those cars are going, because you just destroyed that car number 55. I really did, Ken, and you know, once the smoke settled and the car stopped, I crawled out of the car and walked away from it. And that is a testimony to Cliff Champion Leo Jackson, my group. But you spent the night in the hospital. How do you feel today? I feel fine. I just, I really didn't feel that well. I thought it was just my own benefit. I should spend the night so they could closely observe what was going on. That's why Benny Parsons is with us about starting night and not in the thick of this fray. Thomas has come back on the track. And an oil leak. Lap number seven. He's come back out here fighting for points. Kale is first. Earnhardt is second. Richard Petty comes up up on the outside for third. Petty is back into it. Here comes Allison. And down to the inside. Look at Earnhardt struggling to go back by Kaylee Arborough. And it will be Earnhardt in the first place in turn three. Petty had a notion to go with him, then decided that he'd pull up on Kale and follow him. But Earnhardt was the fast one at that point. Front three, front four, five, six. Make it a dozen, make it two dozen. All together, down into the fly over another time. Here's Richard Petty taking a look at Kaylee Arbor on the high side this time. Underneath the starter stand, and on the inside, here comes Baker. Baker is strong. And as we mentioned, oh. and it touches Kale Yarborough. They both keep control. How do you do? Baker right there. Kale is not the man to touch. Look at Baker's car, how squirrely it is as they get down the mixed up air down on the inside. When we say squirrely, of course, that's the car is moving back and forth. Better than 200 miles an hour into turn number three. They are side by side. You are inside Richard Petty's car. Here's a move by Elliott. It's said that the Ford cars are very good for drafting because of the design. Bob, uh, Benny, you've had experience with both kinds of cars drafting at these high speeds. Well, I haven't driven one of the new Thunderbirds that we're seeing out here today, Ned, but just looking at the car and understanding aerodynamics, it looks like it would be one of the better cars. Petty moves in. Looking like he's on a busy interstate, the Long Island Expressway, just dodging between cars at 40, 45 miles an hour, except this is 200 miles an hour, and the world passes over, and there is the battle for the lead, all of it. You know, Ken, people would say there's no way these cars are running 200 miles an hour, but they are especially prepared automobiles. They're not stock cars, they're not Chevrolets and Fords and Chrysler that you can go by. They're worked on and spent many, many hours developing these cars for the speed we're seeing today. And many, many thousands of dollars. And many dollars. 29 laps will be complete this time. Off in the scene in the early going are big express trains like this in Talladega. That's Robbie Allison's crew chief, Gary Nelson, keeping his eye on what Allison's doing. Of course, he's right in the thick of that battle. Earnhardt stays first. The number 28 car, Kaylee Arborell, maintaining second. The rest of the field tagging along. Richard Petty in the third. And here's an Elliott. Elliott back into it with Terry Labonte on the inside of the 44 car, the blue car. Now with uh, Labonte coming up on the inside, Ken Baker's had a problem then on the inside by himself, but now maybe he can hook up with Labonte and be able to move on up uh, as two working together. Two cars on the inside, will that stabilize the front car, Benny Parsons? It will help the front car somewhat, but it is not as good as the cars on the outside, Ken. 30 laps, 80 miles, 79.8 miles complete, this time by. In the 16th annual, live coverage of the Talladega 500 to the stripe, Earnhardt perseveres in first place. Right there in second. And now you're back another time with Bill Elliott and that Fort Thunderbird. Look at the chewing gum along there. You can tell this is a, a big, long race. I think he has at least five chews for this one, Ned. He figures one for every 100 miles, I guess. You can see his right foot as he goes up and down on the gas. He can't run full throttle, Benny Parsons, around even though they're right there. Well, that's right. Not with the cars in front of him because the draft is so important and it helps that car so much that he's able to literally back off the shoulder and still run 200 miles an hour. Richard Petty going for it. Richard Petty pulling up for the lead. 22 cars, the lead pack. Richard Petty is trying to take that first spot. They are side by side coming through the fourth turn down into the tri-oval. Petty bottom side, Dale Earnhardt high, Kelly Arboro right behind, followed by Bobby Allison in fourth. Back in front goes Earnhardt. It would take an awfully strong engine to be able to pass down on the inside. Richard's going to wish he had done that before this is over, I'll tell you. One through 22. 
22 cars are two seconds apart. 22 cars, six seconds apart. Further, two seconds, 2.06 seconds. Running very close. Now, you see Penny has had to fall back in line, and then you said he's going to wish that he hadn't have done that. He's back in fifth instead of battling for the lead. What happened when he went Well, out? he gets on the bottom side of the racetrack, and there just isn't, a, you just don't have enough power to get up off those turns on the bottom of the racetrack, particularly when you've got that string of cars that are drafted on the outside and leave you there for yourself. You've got to have someone to draft with if you're going to do that. He may be able to do this in 10, in 10 laps or 15 laps when the tires are hot and the cars can't handle, maybe he can run down them. Right now they've got fresh tires, everybody's handling them. Further back in the field, in that ninth position, is Kyle Petty. In 10th is Jim Richmond, running 11th is Lake Speed. In the 12th position right now, there's Dan Neil Bonnet, and going 13th is Tommy Ellis. In the 14th position is Ricky Rudd, and running 15th, back up to 15th, comes Darrell Walton, who's making a great charge. Average speed through 30 laps, 159.6 miles per hour. That is not a record. Here's a word from Mike Joy. I'm in the middle of the lead car, Dale Earnhardt. Each team keeps its own score chart of the individual laps as they come. Got a crash at turn number four, and that is the car number two that's being driven by Elliot Forbes Robinson today. Elliot Forbes Robinson has socked the wall at turn number four. He has lost an engine, Ken. I, I would see, you see the smoke coming out of the exhaust pipes? That means that's water that's gotten in the exhaust pipes and they're so hot that we're seeing steam come out of there. And when the engine lets go, water all gets under those rear wheels. You don't have much control. That's exactly what happened to me the other day in Friday when I crashed was I blew an engine, which caused the problem. Former Trans Am champion Elliot Forbes Robinson has brought out the second caution of the afternoon in the 32nd lap when the crash took place. Field now working in lap number 33. Caution flag in the hand of Harold Kinder, and let's see if we can discern anything from what happened up there in turn number four with this replay. He's already in the slide, apparently the engine let go as he started into turn three, they all got under the wheel and just sent him spinning around and around and now he comes down off of the high banking, going backwards of course, see the front end of the car bashed in as he got into the wall very hard. The Robert Harrington car number two, formerly one of the Jim Stacy stable cars, Elliot Forbes Robinson taking a savage beating in the fourth turn here at the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Here is a report from Mike Joy. Dale Earnhardt is on pit road. Richard Childress, Kurt Schaumbardine of the team have gotten real good pit service this year and it's helped Earnhardt to the point standing championship. They're going all the way around to change four tires. Let's go down pit road to Chris Economaki. And national champion Bobby Allison is doing the same thing. He's already had his outside tires changed. Tires are very important here in Talladega. Not only to have the fresh ones on, but to have the right diameter. The difference in diameter is called in racing the stagger. And if the stagger is right, a car can really go. And if it's wrong, the driver is in real trouble. Back to you, Ken. It's pit road and the action is for the moment. Waiting for a report on Elliott Ford's Rock. Uh, Richard Petty is coming to a halt down at the exit of pit road, number 43. There you see it. You're in the car now. And he's turning things off and he may have cooked something on number 43. There is smoke coming out from underneath the car and it's I think something has happened to the engine. Like, it really is. But he was right up there in the thick of the battle. No indication when he was running under the green that he had problems. But here, after making a pit stop, just heading back out. Something wrong with Richard Petty at Pontiac. And you can see Richard now reaching down to unbuckle his safety equipment. Now taking the window screen loose. So apparently that's going to yeah, be all. Push it back up, are you? Richard Petty, can we get a word with you? We'll try to, we're going to try to get a word from him in just a moment here. He told his crew to try to push it back up there, so yeah, maybe he thinks... He's walking away from it, so that's... Um... Elliot Forbes Robinson. Richard Petty, this is Ken Squire at CBS. Yeah, go ahead. What happened? Well, I think the, the transmission come out of it. I just left the pit in first gear, and when I shifted the second, everything broke loose. And I, I think the back of the transmission probably broke. Can it be repaired and get you back out here for points? Uh... According to how big a hurry they want to get in. Yeah, it could, it could be repaired. We'll see, sort of see what's going on. I have to get it back up to the garage here and see. All right, sir. Richard Petty, number 43. Let's see if we can see. There was, there's this when he was coming out. And as he came out. And he said as he something broke the right there. 
Yeah, and you can see that smoke. Yeah, and apparently it did burst the transmission or something. If it had been a drive shaft, we wouldn't see the grease and the oil come out of it. That's correct. Uh, Car number 43, sapped of strength for just a moment. They're going to do some repair work and try to get Richard Petty back in this event. And this car is making its last appearance before it becomes a museum piece. Richard was kidding about that. He said they ought to put me in there with it. <laughs> Averaging more than one official lead change every two laps thus far in the running of the Talladega 500. Teddy's car. Wrong way, Richard coming up pit road here. They hustle it back trying to get that car in for additional work. Now, two cars have broken drivetrains today, and we'll ask you the net, Jared, or Benny Parsons. Here at Alabama, that's that's pretty critical, getting off pit road as much as the activity on, on the racetrack. It is very critical because running 200 miles an hour on the racetrack, sometimes you come into the pit, you you lose the concept of speed, and then especially when you try to accelerate and go back out, Benny, which puts a lot of extra strain on the drive. It really does. And you know, there has, there's always the controversy here, what gear do you run a open rear end, like they use in street cars, or a locked rear end that, that both wheels pull? And a locked rear end is better for leaving the pits because you have both rear tires pulling, but it's worse on the transmission and drive shaft because as you let the clutch out, you have all that power going and you don't have any tire slippage. And when the tire's spinning, that's simply a saving the clutch and the transmission. Richard Petty's car being pushed back. We're going to try and get some work done on that car in the drivetrain and get him back into action. 37 laps have now been completed and as they are lining up for this restart, taking place when they come by this time with a car number 75, Dave Marcus in the lead. Let's go to Mike Joy. When the caution came out, Ken, we were talking to Richard Childress. He's the crew chief on what was the lead car at the time, Dale Earnhardt. A lot goes on here on pit road between pit stops. They chart every lap of the race, and you can see the lap times below 48 seconds. The first seven laps of this race run at over 200 miles an hour. And when Earnhardt went back to the lead on lap 24, that was also a 200-plus mile an hour lap. Another crewman keeps track of gas mileage. Another measures tires for comfort as they have to adjust air pressure to keep that stagger that's so important in the right perspective that Chris Economaki talked about. Richard Childress, are you surprised that this race is so fast that we've had nine laps of this race over 200 miles an hour? Well, not really. With the weather conditions today, we anticipated running over 200, and we made a couple of changes this morning for the uh, weather. You're the point standing leaders, but you guys really need a win. Yeah, we need a win. We'll hope to come today, or if not, our time's coming. It's really competitive this year. Well, they're up front and in position to do so. Back to you, Cap. All right. Here's how they line up as they come down on the start. It'll be Dave Marcus out in front of the Raymock team, number 75 for first. In the second now is Neil Bonnet. Running third on the restart will be the car number nine, Bill Elliott. And moving up to fourth is Harry Gant, who won at Pocono, Pennsylvania, in a 500 mile there just last Sunday. As they... Phil, Phil Parsons is back in the action now, Ken, even though several left down. Ron Bouchard is in fifth, and on the start, Bouchard started to slip back a little, then picks it back up and goes after them. The leader for the moment, Dave Marcus, started from the pole and won this race, this Talladega 500. Right on his back bumper is Neil Bonnet, who drove this car number 75 last year for Bob Haley and Butch Fox, who owned the Raymond team. So he knows what he's got to pass. He won several races in that car in 1983. Now there's Bonnet right there in that second spot, and they get just a little bit of breathing room, but the freight train is about to overhaul them. There's Elliott back in third. 39 laps complete, 188 this time by Marcus out in front native of Wisconsin, staying in first, an Alabama driver in second. And here comes Elliott, the Georgia driver in the Ford Thunderbird, goes down to the bottom of the track, and look how easy that car moves through, Ned. He wasted no time whatsoever. He just caught Bonnet, moved right on the inside, and flew right around it. Wouldn't surprise me to see him move around the Marcus going into turn three. Let's see if he does. He pulls out to make the pass. Here he goes. Here's Elliott going for the lead another time, and Marcus relegated to second position. Jody Ridley. Jody Ridley. The Cumberland car beginning to show some strength out here. Good race. Former rookie of the year when he drove for Judy Donlevy, the number 84. Right side of your screen trying to make a move. The 84 car, and Baker gets underneath it. Baker wastes no time in getting back up towards the front. His car looks off the strong here today, too. Lots of rumors. This is Baker's last year with the Wood Brothers. There was a meeting going on this morning with Kyle Petty of the Wood Brothers. There's been rumors that he might go to that car next year. 
point is that Kyle Petty has an arrangement with his sponsor for three years, and he might well take that somewhere besides from his own grandfather's shop. The rumors here this week have been awfully strong that Kyle might leave the Petty Enterprises. Of course, Richard Petty left Petty Enterprises last winter and drives for the Mike Curb Racing Associate. And if Kyle did leave, don't know what might happen to that. Elliott now is second place here in Ed. Benny Parsons. Buddy Baker is driving like a man possessed out there. I think that he's heard all these rumors, and I think he's trying to get himself in position for next year right now. Ned. He's listening to that, Jerry. Here's Elliot now up, making a shot for the lead. Neil Bonnet on the inside. Being pushed by Buddy Baker, but now Baker decides, well, maybe I ought to move up here behind Bill Elliott. He seems to be the strongest at this point and get some help from his board buddy. Elliot was the 10th different leader in the event. Well, then he says, we'll just make it three deep going into the turn body. Oh. And, and it's Baker. Done. Look at Baker come through and Bouchard. Now, there's the move that gave Bouchard the win here in 1981. Blue top, red bottom on car number 47. That car that just glided down across the track right to the bottom and picked up a couple of spots. So Baker's now first. And Ron Bouchard is in second, the Fitchburg, Massachusetts ace, who cut his teeth in modified racing in the New England area. Now back into second place, and he has an excellent brother coming along. Kenny Bouchard is looking stronger every year. He runs very strong in the modified circuit up in the northeast where Ronnie Bouchard got most of his experience. Hello, here he comes again. Dale Earnhardt trying to be the first man in history. Oh, just slides in there. And look at Bouchard have to work number 47 as he almost overrode car number three, taking that spot. How about that, Benny Parsons? I'll tell you what, that three car, Dale Earnhardt, is extremely strong today. He is the strongest I've seen him all year because he was third in line there going down the back straight. We pulled out and almost passed the front two cars. And at Talladega, that's very difficult to do. Takes some horsepower to do it, and also the car's got a handle when you get in the turn. Now, you see Elliott has already been pushed back to the fifth position. There's Jeff Bodine right in there behind Bobby Allison. And on the inside is the Terry Labonte car, Bill Parsons, number 66, back on the track and scrambling. At 40 laps, the average speed, 147.153 miles per hour. And we have completed 43 laps to date. 114 miles are down. Here's Bodine underneath Bobby Allison. Coming up on late speed in car number one on the outside. Now, Bodine got some help from Tim Richmond, who we see up in front in the red car, down on the inside of the track. But now, Allison gets the momentum coming up behind Lake Speed. Draft plays such an important role in, in making your passes here. Swapping positions, officially, they only count lead changes at the start-finish line. You can see there's wholesale changes in positions going on. Kyle Petty is in. Looks like a heating problem on car number seven. Tough luck. He was running very strong. He had come from 26th position up to about 11th before the first caution. But now Kyle in the midst of uh, running any chances he might have of winning this race. Lost almost his entire pit crew. What, five of them were fine? Let's go to Mike Joy. Quick word. Ken, they're just flooding that car with water. It is indeed overheating. They're not sure of the reason, but anything they can cool off, they're going to and try to get it back in the race for points. The leaders go by and Kyle will go a lap down. New leader on the racetrack. Whoop, take it back. Ron Bouchard headed for just about six seconds, and bang, there goes Buddy Baker right back into first. Bouchard said hello. I think he headed at the line. He may be credited Bouchard with leading for a minute. Oh, that's not the story, according to our statistician, Bob Blackford. He led, but not where it counted. Baker back in first. Earnhardt into second. Bouchard to third. Kaylee Arbor on the 28 car. On the outside in fourth. Then Bill Elliott in fifth. Here's Chris Economac. We spoke about stagger a little bit ago. That's the difference in circumference from inside wheel to the outside wheel. And that dimension was always measured with a tape measure. It cost three or four dollars. But now a tool has been made to measure. It's a hundred and fifty dollar stagger master. And they just put it on here like this and move it up and they get the reading. A quarter of an inch difference from the outside to the inside makes a great deal of difference on the racetrack. Back to you, Ken. Leaders now down into turn number one. Baker first. And Earnhardt on the getting caught up as they go into the back straightaway. Another time, Bouchard is there. Working down toward the 50th lap of the Talladega 516th annual. Last lap at an average speed of 200.3 miles per hour. And the man on the point is this man, number 21, Buddy Baker, with Cale Yarborough currently in the second position. We've completed 50 laps as they come by this time. 33 miles have been completed on this 2.6 mile track. Next motorsports event on CBS. 
August 11th, the International Race of Champions final round from the Michigan International Speedway. Here's Cale going into second. That's Saturday, August 11th, live flag to fly coverage with three onboard cameras. Benny Parsons, how about that one? Well, I tell you, I think everybody has been kind of feeling each other out as we've been, along, been going on through the first three races, but they're going to pay the money after August 11th. It's time to get serious. $150,000 to win International Race of Champions this year. Lead change once again. Give it back to Cale Yarbrough, number 28. That amazing Waddell Wilson prepared car out in front. Patricia now stands at six. A.J. Foyt has just retired, and so is Joe Rutman's number 98. Rutman and Foyt have retired from the event. Let's take a look at who is out of this race as we watch Cale Yarbrough on the point. There you see the cars that have come out. Elliott Forbes Robinson, the heaviest victim here, crashing hard in turn number four. He walked away from that incident. Petty, they're working on his car. Clutch gone on Grant Edcox, he may come back. Randy Baker, no hopes for him today. We'll update the story here at 50 laps. We've had 10 different leads, leaders, and the lead has been swapped 25 times. Just amazing, that too. It really is. The average speed, of course, is reduced by the caution flags that we've had. Now let's go to fifth and back joint. Well, Ned, a minute ago, we showed you how the teams keep lap charts. Here's another way to do it. Kyle Petty's team has a personal computer on pit road. It charts the number of laps in the race, the number of laps he's run, his lap speed, and how long it's been since he made a fuel stop. The computer's great, but they still keep the handheld chart as a backup. Last lap at 199.01 miles per hour. Back straight away. Lead car is about to be challenged once again. It's Yarbrough on the outside and down on the inside. Here comes Buddy Baker in a rush at over 200 miles an hour. He takes another glimpse of first place. Here's Chris Economaki. They talk about the high cost of racing. Well, one hidden cost is a replacement windshield about $100. This was taken out of Lake Speed's car a little bit ago. Would you believe that this windshield was changed in under a minute? It's interesting to know that the windshield glass doesn't fly. They're specially made. They have a layer of plastic inside, and the glass is held to it with a glue. A safety precaution, another expense. Back to you, Ken. A crash. I believe that may be funny area. It's number 90, Richard Brooks's car. Richard Brooks, former winner of this event, has crashed. The 1973 winner, his Ford, the Junie Donlevy car, crashed just at the start-finish line and has landed about 800 feet beyond it. We see a lot of smoke coming from it, Ken. It's hard to tell, although we do see smoke coming from the exhaust pipe, and as Benny Parsons mentioned earlier, that's an indication that something let go inside the engine of that car, and that perhaps caused a spin. That happened in the 52nd lap. Lap number 52. Brooks is the 1969 Rookie of the Year on the Grand National Circuit, and is the only driver in today's uh, race who participated in their in the inaugural event here in 1969. He drove his own Plymouth and finished fifth in the wake of the infamous uh, driver's boycott of that first race. He was running 19th, and there you see the car breaking away in the trioval. Back end goes into the wall, rotates, slams the front end. He once rolled about 12, 13 times in the back straightaway here. Here he is just across the start-finish line, and he'll end up down in the grass. Very fortunate, Ken, that he didn't hit the wall any harder than he did, and now the car scoots down into the grass area, and that's where it uh, rests right now. He is still sitting in the car and waiting for, for some assistance. Richard Brooks in Carnabinati, California native, now beginning to unstrap. Here's Benny Parsons. Well, that's really and truly the safest place to be in because those cars that are going by on the racetrack, they look like they're going 50 miles an hour, but in fact, they're probably running 125 miles an hour, so you need to stay in the car. We'll be back. Longest walk in sports is not from the bullpen. The longest walk in sports is when you've tried your very best. You take that long walk away from a car that you had so much hope that would change your destiny. Richard Brooks, car number 90, originally out of Porterville, California, and a great favorite. Now, after he crashed, he left some debris on the track, and Jody Ridley, then running in six, overran it, Ned, and there's the result. He blew a tire, and he's had some problems. He did blow a tire as he went across the start-finish line, hitting some of the debris off of Brooks' car. Tough break for him, just an innocent victim of circumstances. Joe Rutman lost an engine. A.J. Foyt, they say, lost his power steering. That's an update on those two stories today. We are at... 
the Alabama International Motor Speedway. There is a crowd near 100,000 here today. But the story of American motorsports may best be told by tracks away from the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Chris Economaki filed this report. If you're young and withered in this country, surely you've been touched by Saturday Night Fever. In one section of these United States, it could be a disco, another section a rock concert, perhaps a night at the movies, or a high school football game. But if you're from the red clay states of the South, dotted with quarter mile and fifth mile racetracks, Saturday Night Fever is a stock car track. Fun and exciting. Yeah, it's an exciting race. Everybody comes out and raises their mothers and daddies and kids and nephews and races and friends, anybody that wants to come. After a strenuous week of peanut and soybean farming, it's a pleasant stroll. And like everything else, prices have gone up. But it's a wonderful night out for the entire family, for the grandfather right on down to the grandchildren. When the green flag drops, it makes it worth it all because it's competition they come to see. This is where it all began, and dirt is where it all started. And that's where the competition is. This is the toughest place in the world to win a race. I'd like to see Bobby, Kell, and Daryl come over here and run. <laughs> yes, sir. Let them go. Watch them. Down in the front straight away. Watch this car one on the inside. He'll peek on the inside. Get he done. Watch them down the back straight away. They wean them young. And it's the competition that counts here, not how much the car costs or who the sponsor is. It's the driver from my town beating the driver from your town on the high banks of this red clay track. As far as wheel to wheel and side by side stuff, it's pretty hard to beat this. This is tough here. Yeah. I guarantee you. It's every man for himself and then some. And the racing is close and fast and sometimes a little bit rough as the fans watch to see whether their man wins and then now and then the engines start to go. It's a costly sport. You can't win them all. I guess anybody would like to go Grand National, you know, but I like the dirt too, you know, I enjoy it. Everybody that does this has a dream of racing over there, but very few of them come true. It's a lot easier to dream on a full stomach. Souvenirs and something to eat and drink are part and parcel. It all adds up for the economy here at the Talladega Short Track. Brings in a, a lot of revenue, uh, a lot of out-of-town drivers race here on, for our special events and even on a weekly basis, and uh, uh, we've been very fortunate to draw good crowds here at Talladega Short Track. What it all adds up to is big business. For every year, more than 55 million Americans buy tickets to auto races, making it the largest non-betting spectator sport. And those numbers don't come from the Alabama International Motor Speedway down the street, Indianapolis or Daytona, but from the more than 1,000 little raceways that dot this countryside, like the Talladega Short Track. Back on the other side of the street, at the Alabama International Motor Speedway, a tribute to all those short trackers across America who make this the Super World Series of Racing what it is. Let's go to Chris Economy. Well, Dick Brooks, what brought that about out there, that whirly gig on the track? Well, you know, we were, we were in a position to where if we were going to make a show and we had to do it like that, you know? <laughs> no, seriously. We lost, uh, lost something in the engine, I don't know, and, and it, I was doing pretty good with it, and I pushed the clutch in, and then, and then it uh, just slid out from under me, and... and uh, I don't, it had to be something to bottom in because it was a lot of oil, so. But I, I've forgotten how far those things slide, man. <laughs> well, we'll go through your mind, you're twirling like that. Well, just trying to, you know, make sure that you got a, some kind, some sort of idea which direction you're going in and, uh, and try to steer away from anything. I know when I turned all the way around and I seen I was going to hit the wall in the back, then the next thought was don't hit the inside wall. So I let the car turn around and then lifted the brakes a little bit. When it got going straight, I pushed it back down. And it stayed straight, then it didn't hit anything else, so... Uh, sometimes it's a lot of luck, but it worked that time. You look okay? Any sore spots? No, 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 I didn't... I barely hit. It just, uh... You know, we were lucky. The Lord was with us, I guess. Okay, better luck to you next time. But now up pit road to Mike Joy. Well, Joe Rutman, Randy Baker, Dick Brooks, and this fella are in the garage area. Richard, any chance of getting this car back in the race? Well, we're trying to. They, they had to change transmission with us to the tail shaft right after we made a pit stop, and... As I went out and changed gears, the rest of the tail shaft on the thing, all the grease runs out and starts bobbling. So they think they can get it back in. In fact, they're almost ready to get it back in. Now we've got to determine if we're so far behind, we might be better not to wear the car out and take chances on, uh, you know, getting in more trouble. 
Well, even though you're not in the running for the win, there's such a big pot of gold at the end of the season, you've got to get out there and run for points yeah. if you can. I think that's one thing they're looking at, you know, as far as the point standing at the end of the season, one or two positions can mean, uh, you know, a bunch of bucks. So, uh, you know, even though you don't make it here, you might can make it at the end of the year. Right. Richard Petty trying to get back in the race elsewhere in the garage area. A.J. Foyt is out of the event, and this is Elliott Forbes Robinson's car, or rather, what's left of it. If you'd taken that wrap in your passenger car, that front bumper would probably be up somewhere around the windshield. Now, they're not trying to get this car back in the race, but they'll try to get it ready to race at Atlanta in November. Back upstairs. 58 laps have been completed, 154 miles. 26 cars are still in the lead lap. Ready for a restart. And our live coverage of the Talladega 500 on this Sunday afternoon at the end of July. And right now, Bobby Allison is in command from Colorado Springs, Colorado. A 20-year-old driver, Clark Dwyer, is second. Terry Labonte runs in third. Kelly Arborough is fourth. Neil Bonnet is up to fifth. The safety car comes in and they come by. They have completed 60 laps. 159 and a half miles down. To the strike. Green is coming out. 25 cars in the lead lap. Dallas is breaking away up in front. Labonte second. Kelly Arborough right there. He's moving into it. And also up there just Sixth position is car number three, Dale Earnhardt. Which has been so strong. Allison got a good jump on the restart camp, but uh, that lead won't last too long. Once they pick his draft up, they'll be right back on him, as we see now as they head down the back stretch. Three cautions to date, and Kaylee Arborough closing rapidly on Bobby Allison. The car number 22 putting a lap on Phil Parsons. As they go down to the three, and here comes Kale, making short work of closing up on the leader. Kelly Arborough surveys the prospects for first spot as they come through turn number four. Ducks back in, 44 Labonte right there, top three. Just incredible racing. And these fans, fans agree. Oh, they <laughs> really are loving it here today. They've been up and down. They're going to be worn out at the end of the race. Side by side for the lead, Labonte tucks in. Labonte lies forward. The maroon and white car, number 12, the Warner Hudson car right there in fourth. And there you see, and further back, here comes that 47 down to the bottom. That is Ron Bouchard, the fellow that won in 81. And from inside, Bill Elliott's car, you're watching Bouchard working against the 7 car, which you just saw had problems earlier, was in the pits. Kyle Petty still making the go of it. Lead change. They work right. It's not in the lead. That's just back a spot or two. They in the lead. They pulled over the two cars. Yes, Bonnet is beginning to flex his muscles. He's been in it, trying to think of the battle here, but not really up there for the lead that much. But right now he's there, but here comes Earnhardt. Boy, he has fought for the lead all afternoon. Allison back there in third. Dale Yarborough falling back. Bouchard pulls up, rather Ricky Rudd pulls up. He's in the fourth. Here's Richard Petty getting back in car number 43. Last time out for that number 43. Thanks, well, they apparently surveyed the situation after making the repair skin, decided it would be worth it to get back out and try to get some of those Western Cup points. Earnhardt first, number 22, Allison second, Labonte is third, Kelly Arbor riding fourth, turn three, working the 63rd lap of 188, front four, Elliott's car. Now, as we come into the tri-oval, Elliott, once again, as we saw in Michigan, could be a real factor before this one is over. There are so many cars that look so strong in the going up to this point in this race, it would be awfully hard to pick a winner. Do you pick a line in here, Benny Parsons, or do you just follow and find the hole? I think that Bill Elliott's probably doing the wisest thing. He's just following along. He's trying to see who's the best. Uh, who is, can run, who can't run. I think before the day's over, he'll be a serious contender. Here comes Baker. The number 21 car drops to the inside. There's Allison, your leader. There's Baker in the middle of the track, and Kale gets pressed really high. And remember, that 21 has not been as stable as some other cars out there now. They have run together several times, and they're very close friends. And when they're off the racetrack, but boy, they aren't showing out there today. They're going at it. A true test of friendship. <laughs> Bouchard lines up side by side of Earnhardt. Allison stays right there. Folks in Alabama love to see him run and win. As long as 
those cars are running side by side back there, it's going to be hard for them to move around Bobby Allison. But now the Kale that moved up on his back bumper, that might push Allison over on that front. Here comes Teddy back into the action. Richard Teddy, number 43, coming back to make a go of it yet today. Points all important. Baker breaks into second place. And he picked up the draft of Bobby Allison from the inside and scooted right up behind him. Draft like a wake off a motorboat. He just scooped up the bottom side of the V. You can hear the crowd cheering almost over the sounds of these engines. 600 horsepower at full song. Three wide across the start line. Like bullets out of a 30-30 down to the turn number one. Allison deployed first. And Richard Petty comes back up on the banking like riding in a barrel on these five-story high, high banks. What is the sensation like, Benny Parsons? You know, Kim, people have asked that question before, and it's so hard to explain. It's very difficult. I think that there isn't words to explain. You just have to be there. On the inside, Bouchard moving in. Here's Bouchard, again, three wide in turn number four. Allison stays in front. Richard Petty is down how many laps? About 25, 30? 30, 30 laps now, so no, no chance of getting even a high position, but still, every position that he might get, somebody else falls out, well then that will give him a few more points. Get to the Waldorf Astoria, and it will be a big payoff. And that kind of traffic we see in New York when they go to Waldorf uh, Astoria for the banquet in December. 199.7 miles per hour in the last lap. What's the sensation like there, Benny Parsons? That looks like the start of a race at 60 miles an hour, but those cars are running 195 to 200. The sensation is you don't want to be there. Let me out of there because it's too nerve-wracking. Your heart can't stand it. Ron Bouchard has taken the lead again. Here comes Elliott down on the inside. Will Bill Elliott this time. pushing for second place. Baker up on the high side as they come by. 67 laps complete this time of 188. 178 miles down. Boy, Labonte got awfully close to the wall that time. A marvelous piece of driving as he gathered it back in. I think he did touch the wall. It'd be interesting to see if he got any sheet metal up there, perhaps pushing it in against the tire. Dale Earnhardt currently the leader in the Grand National Standings back there in seventh spot. Here they are, single filing down to the back straightaway. Bouchard in front, and here comes Baker back, and here comes Allison back for the lead. It is Baker into first, Allison into second, and Bouchard falling back in turn three. Swapping back and forth. Now, are they setting each other up here? What are they doing at this time, Benny Parsons? Well, each of these fellows right now are just simply feeding their egos because they want to lead the race and they want to prove to their crew and everyone else that they can lead the race, and they are. Ron Bouchard was the 13th official race leader in the first 67 laps, Ned. Unbelievable competition we have going here today, and Benny, I suspect that some of them are trying some of those moves. If it gets down and they're in that same position at the end of the race, just to see what they can do. Oh, they want to know. Sure, that's exactly right, Ned. Bobby Allison wants to know who he can pass and who he's going to have trouble passing. So that, therefore, he'll make his decision with two or three laps to go. Well, he took Ron Bouchard right with him and flew right around. Buddy Baker, two cars working together. Bouchard, he wants to leave this thing again. It's the first time that he had led, and I believe, in the first six or seven laps, even though he's been right in the thick of the battle. Kyle Petty made an unscheduled stop and has come back on the track. 69 laps complete this time by. Back with Elliott another time. Kaylee Arboro. It's all there with the Arboro's car, and he's back beside Baker another time. They have a lot Siamese of confidence. twins with yeah. another Ford to Chevrolet. They have a lot of compliments in each other. You have to have if you're going to run that close together. And Benny Parsons, there are some drivers out there that you don't run that close together. Well, there's some drivers that you know what's going on when you come off the turn that they're not going to give you the room that you're required, so you simply have to back off the accelerator. There's others, you know you know who will give you room and who won't, so therefore, you just drive accordingly. Nine lead changes in the last ten laps. Here's Allison, still staying out in front, and the only price will be by Aaron Scott. Bouchard's number 47, down on the inside, staying right there battling. Benny, it looks like his there. car is handling awfully well, even though it's not one of the better uh, cars of the design of the line. Well, that's the thing that I've been impressed with so far is that the cars that are not aerodynamically sound, you know, the Buicks and the Fords are probably not as good as the Chevrolet as aer in aerodynamics, but yet Bouchard, Bobby Allison, and the Fords of Baker Dell have led this race, so that tells me that the handling today is very, very important. Of course, that horsepower is helping right now. 
Okay, what helps the most out here? Horsepower, handling, what is it? I think that horsepower and aerodynamics are the most important thing, but all those without a chassis won't work. So it, it takes a combination of everything, really, true. Sure looks to me like you've got to have the handle today. There's Bodine nipping away. Right back up in there, behind the seventh place car. Uh, car number three, the Earnhardt car, dancing a little here. Boy, well, he gets close to that wall if he came over there. 71 laps down. There's Bouchard, the number five, right behind the three. And there's that 47 that slipped back. He went up to the lead and just fell back about five spots. We saw him a moment ago on the inside coming off turn four, and he lost his momentum. He got on the inside, and he don't have the aerodynamics and maybe not the horsepower. He lost it a little bit, and he was lucky to be able to squeeze in in fifth place. Or the, the way they gathered him up. There's a problem on Bouchard's windshield, Ken. We see on this course they have taped it. During that last caution period, they taped that crack. Hopefully it won't burst open anymore, but with the pressure that you have at 200 miles an hour, it puts a lot of pressure on that glass. Especially after you get a small crack. Running eighth on the field, Terry Labonte. Running in ninth is Neil Bonnet, and in tenth is Darrell Waltrip. 72 laps now to get off these leaders when they're running that tight together now. Just unbelievable racing. We see that Labonte is sticking right up there in that front pack, so apparently that little brush with the wall a few left back didn't hurt him too much because he's still able to run fast and uh, not, losing, uh, not hurting a tire. Still another lead change. Kaylee Arborough goes for it. In car number 28 in, Baker comes along for the bottom. For second spot, Allison relegated to third. Let's go to Chris Economac. Yeah. 650 horsepower engines are let go. They put black marks on the track. But when Richard Petty decided he had to stop with his car, it tore up some of the asphalt and a lot of his tires. Just an example of some of the forces that are not acting on these cars today. Now down pit road to Mike Joy. That crack in Ron Bouchard's windshield is something they've dealt with before. Jack Beebe's the car owner. You've had cracked windshields, drop window nets, all kinds of problems like this at this racetrack. Yeah, but I think we've got them all solved now. We've got Wayne on here and he's doing a good job. He's talking about new crew chief, Wayne Baumgartner, and of course they've also won here in 1981. When that happened, Bouchard credited Baker for teaching him how to draft with the victory. And they're good friends on track and off, and I'm not surprised to see Baker and Bouchard drafting together. We'll see a lot of that this afternoon. Bouchard's going to, he and Buddy Baker are promoting a short track race up in New England next weekend. Ken and he and Richard Petty are, and uh, Buddy Baker are all going to be racing against each other. Thompson Speedway. Here they are, back in the main straightaway. It is Kale first, second spot is Baker's car, then comes Allison, and Bill Elliott lies fourth in the field. So you have those General Motors products intermixed very nicely with the Ford products out there. They're getting equal time as they go down the back straightaway. Same to be, and uh, they are running fairly equal speed, but Buddy Baker is not content running second. Oh, indeed. Here's Baker going for it again. Buddy Baker taking a shot at leading this race another time, now passing Buddy Arrington. 78 laps deep, 207 miles into the 188 lap Talladega 500 for a near half million dollar first. 23 cars running the lead lap, and they're all right here battling for first place. At the moment, the lead has been swapped another time, and now it's Jerry Labonte's effort in the Dale Inman car. He's up in front. The second place car remains the Buddy Baker machine. And Benny Parsons, I think, you picked the right day to come up and watch the race from up here. I really did. If I was going to watch a race from in the booth, this was an excellent day to do it. Because I tell you, in the race car, you realize those spots are close. It is close competition, but it don't scare you like watching it from up here. I watch it again, and I, it, my heart just jumps in my throat because it, it looks like they're going to crash every corner of every lap. You watch it that way out there when you're no, it don't look that bad. You're watching it live here on CBS, and the amazing thing to me is. Here you have all these runners competing against each other and yet working in concert in such unison. If one has a problem, it's a problem for all of them. And the fact they can run at 200 miles an hour, as we watch right here, our live pictures from Talladega, Alabama, and run so flawlessly and yet really depend so much on each other. They simply exist now. They absolutely do depend on each other a great deal. Ten a little while ago, we said that they were averaging a lead change every two laps. For the last 18 laps, we have had 14 changes. Tim Richmond has gone behind the wall. He was one of those that hoped to be up in the front running. Another lead change and Buddy Baker goes into the lead. Richmond, the eighth retiree from the event. Now there's Bill Elliott getting inside in our two car cameras side by side out here. There 
there is Jeff Bodine, last lap at 199.8 miles per hour. That's from Bodine's car. And that's from Elliott's car looking the other way. That's, a, that's seventh and eighth. Go down to the corner. Bodine, of course, has two short track victories this year. Brand new team that was put together this year with Harry Hyde, the crew chief has done an excellent job. Some people said that maybe he was over the hill. He'd been away from the sport too long. He hadn't been in a tough car in the last several years, but he has proven that he still knows what's going on. Out in front, Baker. Ford back in front. And the 44 car stays right there. The Chevrolet of Terry Labonte. The Billy Hagan, Walter Wood car. Paired by Dale Edmund. Back in the tri-oval, 18 degree banking. Allison Lodge third, then the yellow car, the orange and white car, that's Kaylee Yarborough, and comes Bouchard. And notice the blue and yellow that, uh, Wrangler car, which is the number three car of Earnhardt. Now that car was working better earlier than it seems to be now. It was, uh, and after this last pit stop, it doesn't seem to be going quite as well, and then it could be that what sometimes we say a bad set of tires, that's not really the case, but this bad set of tires. Well, the sizing is not exactly right, because he just is not running as well as, as he was earlier on. Excuse me, gentlemen, we have one car way off the pace, and it's a major player, Neil Bennett, ex uh, Neil Bonnet, exiting turn number two very slowly. Bonnet, something is amiss on car number 12 as he's going into the back straightaway. There you see Bonnet, he's way off the pace, Ned, and what an unfortunate situation for Neil Bonnet, the 1980 winner of this Talladega 500. And, of course, he's one of only two Alabama drivers in this Talladega 500, has a lot of fans here looking uh, for him to do well today. He's had a tough year so far. He broke a wrist earlier at Martinsville, Virginia, drove uh, with the injury, and also his crew chief was injured at Daytona, Doug Richard. He's just now getting back. He's still... Uh, uh, on crush is part-time, but Bonnet now another disappointing day as he heads towards Pit Road. 82 laps complete, 218 miles are down. Here's Neil Bonnet coming in. His chance of winning this race the second time. Coming up short. Field hauling down on a turn number four. Terry Labonte in the number 44, staying very much in the hunt. Dale Inman doing a grand job. They've won a race this year out of Riverside. California on the road course in a 400 kilometer event. Here's Bobby Allison right back to the second position, the number 22 car, reviewing further back in the field. Now bonded on pit road, road up. Tommy Ellis, the Virginia driver, is currently in 11th position in the overall standings. Ricky Rudd, the Bud Moore car, is running 12. Perry Gant, last week's winner, is running 13th. Greg Sachs is in 14th. 15th is Dave Marcus. And the 16th position is Trevor Boyce, as we look further back. The 10th position right now is Lake Speed. Good run for rookie Greg Sachs. He's one of the modified hot shoes from up in the Northeast. He makes his home out on Long Island, New York. But he almost didn't get started in this race because his car almost didn't fire. There's Sterling Marlin with smoke coming from underneath his car. We've had eight official retirees, including the Tim Richmond car of recent. Now Labonte is on the inside of the racetrack. Something must be amiss on the car number 44 as Allison goes by on the outside. And he, I don't think he would have made that move just anyway, although he looks like he's still running pretty good, Benny. Now Buddy Baker goes by on the outside, but you don't, you don't just make a move like that uh, unless something maybe is wrong. Uh, I, I would speculate he's on seven cylinders. I, I just think that something happened to the engine and he backed off. He backed off the, the fifth, the sixth, Baker back in front, the 28 car of Kaylee Arborough coming to second, and on the outside, here's the 95 Sterling Marlin car back in the garage area. Across the start finish line. Baker back for first. Really needs a win here today. Here comes Kaylee Arborough back on the outside, and Ron Bouchard is coming with him. Allison Ball into fifth position. At the Alabama International Motor Speedway, you're watching live the battle for supremacy in the 16th annual Talladega 500. Taking a venture at first place, number 47. That is Ron Bouchard on the inside of the Amo Swap some paint net with Kaylee Arboro, who continues to try to hold on to that lead. And here comes car number five. That is Jeff Bodine in the second place here today. And you're with Jeff Bodine in the second position as he follows Kale down into turn number three. Jeff Bodine with his best run. He's come all the way from 28th position. And Bodine is now second. 
89 laps complete when they come by this time. Let's get this word from Mike Joy. You're looking at the broken distributor in Neil Bonnet's car. Neil, this is not the first time for this problem. You guys have had it before. Well, we've been trying some different ignition systems to see if we can get the problem cured. And, you know, I don't know if that's what it is or not. The car kept getting slower and slower, and then it almost quit, so we got to change it. There's a wire coil inside the distributor, and if two of those little wires short out, it's easy to have happen. It puts the whole distributor out of commission, so they're replacing it now. Let's go to Chris Economaki. Batteries here. Okay. Baker, who, who led the race for so many laps, is about to stop here. The men servicing his car are the very famous Wood Brothers, who have earned awards for quick pit stops for many, many years. Now, Glenn Wood out with a sign to guide Buddy to a stop here. He should be coming up almost. We have our stopwatch. The plans are to give him fuel, two tires, clean the windshield, and take care of whatever requirement driver Buddy Baker needs. And here he comes, heading down pit road. Our watch is ready in his number 21 Thunderbird. In they go, and the men are over the wall, only five men allowed over the wall. The watch starts, there's the windshield, men on the outside, taking care of the work. And Baker himself wanting more of a cleaning job. He seems to be more primarily concerned, and... Caution just coming out. And there we, we go. 15, 14, and 10 100 seconds. Back to you, Ken. A hard hit on car number 03. That is the Birchwell car from out of San Antonio, Texas. This youngster making a super speedway appearance. He's been running on the short tracks. His dad used to build the cars for Clarence Lovell that we saw on the Grand National Tour. And this youngster has just taken a savage head-on crash. Brings out the fourth caution of the day. Donnie Allison is crew chief on that car, Ken, and thinks very highly of this young fellow. Car number 03. Caution is out. It's Eddie Birchwell, San Antonio, Texas. Chevrolet, entered by his dad and crew chief by Donnie Allison, has shot into the wall, and you can see it, tremendous damage on the front end of the machine. They were just about ready for scheduled pit stops. Buddy Baker was in the pit, the first of the front runners to come in for a green flag pit stop. We see Bear Quill as he spins around down on the grass. Not much traction once you get on that grass. It looks like the right wheel was almost off the ground. Then it hits the pavement and straightens up. Of course, he had already done the damage on the front end of the car as he got hard into the wall. There lies car number 03. I noticed his hand come up. Driver. I noticed his hand come up as he was spinning there, so he is okay, I believe. Well, you can testify to the tremendous, just brute strength of a crash like that. As uh, we saw, you crash in almost the same place, but the side of the car went in on, on your car number 55 out here on Friday morning. On Friday morning, he got, he got the front end, I got the right side of the car, but it, it literally narrowed my car up about four inches, Ken. It just made it four inches narrow, and I just couldn't believe how, what an impact that car took, and yet everything stayed together. Once again, we're with you live here at the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Benny Parsons and Jared Ken Squire topside, Chris Economaki and Mike Joy in the pits to bring you all the action of the 16th running of this near half million dollar race in which 93 laps have been completed 247 miles as we get toward the halfway point terry labati is staying right up in the hunt looking for his second win of the season behind every driver like terry labati like kaylee arborough bill elliott there are people whose names the average folks just don't know one of them is the crew chief on this car a man named dale inman a man all responsible for so much of what makes this man run. When car 44 heads into the hauler, leaving its home in Thomasville, North Carolina, for whatever track, a couple of names immediately come to mind. Team owner, Louisiana millionaire Billy Hagan, and the driver, Terry Labonte. But it's a third party who measures Hagan's dollars in Labonte's destiny. Every hour Terry spends in the driver's seat is equaled by a week's labor for crew chief Dale Inman. He oversees the activities of 15 people, all striving to make Terry a winner. For over two decades, Inman has been preparing racing cars. How does it feel to be behind the scenes rather than behind the wheel? I just get self-satisfaction for myself, so I don't guess I have to read it in the paper to know that I have contributed, and then what, I guess what really hurts you is when you make a call that might have cost you the race. That's the ones that really hurt and stick with you, because if you are fortunate enough to win a race, 
at that point in time in victory, circling everything, you know, you're content and you're happy and everything, but it don't take me long to get to thinking about the next upcoming race because with the schedule we have, we have to stay right on top of it. Dale Inman's effort to stay on top of it starts at 6 a.m. each morning in Level Cross, North Carolina, just a half mile up the road from his cousin, Richard Petty. Inman's life is divided between two families. There's his wife, Mary, of 24 years, and their children, daughter Tina, and their son Jeffrey. And then there's the other family. I stay with those boys as much as, or more than I stay with my family, I guess, the ones we travel with. Team truck driver Bud Crawford and wife Lou, she also drives in the long hauls and is the official scorer, takes Inman's very expensive second family, over a million dollars, to Michigan or Talladega on any given weekend. A far different journey than what Inman remembers from 25 years ago. We drove race cars to the track. Uh, I went when Lee was driving, and uh, Miss Petty would drive the family car, and he'd have a new engine in, or he'd put a new ring job in the, in the race car, and we'd drive it just to break it in, which was a 100-mile race. In 1958, uh, me and Maurice drove a 57 Mosmobile to Riverside, California, and raced it without the, all the interstates and everything. And then, raced, and then raced the car, and then drove it home. Finished third. At any track, preparation is a ritual. It's a ceremony of detail, of patience, of thoroughness, of making everything and everyone in unison for the upcoming race. It is one of the things that Dale Inman does best. I don't know how he does it. He's about the only guy I've seen that can, that can get 15 people to work together uh, and work together good. It's, it's one of the hardest things there is to do. Our team is is among the top team that, that puts out effort on everything that they do and uh, it, uh, it's a lot of pressure on them too. I mean it, it's not only pressure on me, it's pressure on Terry and it's pressure on them to perform like that and uh, uh, the result that we're looking for is giving top performance and if, if uh, I'm mad sometime maybe I got to swallow my pride and do something different, different and maybe they get mad at me sometime or I get mad at them but uh, we know at the end of the road what we want to do is make that car perform as good as we can and that's, that's total team effort and uh, it's not always easy but that's the, that's the goal that we're searching for. One of the nice people with a real nice family, Dale Inman down at Level Cross. All right, we're getting down to 96 laps complete of the 188. A rookie has crashed here hard, Eddie Beerswell of San Antonio, Texas. Earlier we asked Darrell Waltrip, why do rookies have so many incidents at this track? A track you can run around here at 195 to 200 miles an hour and feel pretty comfortable, feel like that you got everything under control. Therein lies the problem. It kind of lulls some of the drivers to sleep, particularly the younger ones that say, hey, I'm a race car driver. Look at me. I'm going 200. And those are the guys that uh, this racetrack reaches out and bites real quickly. In the Talladega 500, Jeff Bodine has just appropriated first place. Kaylee Yarborough is running second. Darrell Waltrip is in third. Running fourth is Bill Elliott, fifth is Ron Bouchard, sixth is Harry Gant. In the seventh place is Trevor Boyce, and going eighth right now is Lake Speed. Here is a report on pit road from Mike Joy. Well, can at every other major speedway in the country, including Daytona, the start-finish line is located right across where I'm sitting, right at the midpoint of pit road in the tri-oval area, mid-distance between the two turns. And last year, I stood here with Bud Moore, as the cars came by and his driver at the time, Dale Earnhardt, you could see him come by here, but you didn't know he'd won the race. Now, is that frustrating to stand here and not know what's happened, or does it just add to the suspense when you know the finish line is further down the racetrack? Well, you know, when you come by, like I say, uh, last year here, when uh, they come by to get the checker flag, we didn't know who won until till they told us on the radio and, and uh, exactly who won. So it is frustrating when we can't see the start finish line, see who you won or where you didn't. The reason they did that, Ken, the best seats are the ones right in front of Pitt Road and the Tri-Oval. So when they built this track in 1969, to make those seats down near Turn 1 more saleable, that's where they put the finish line, and it's made for some of the best racing in NASCAR history. Well, that is an old promoter. That certainly makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does. Well, now we're over half the distance in the race. We've completed 97 laps, 255 miles are down. How's the field doing? We have 21, amazingly, cars still in at the lead lap and we are past the halfway point. Now, there have been 10 different winners on the series, the circuit, so far this year, pointing up the type of competition that we have. I believe it's 11 different winners instead of 10, and uh, 
and still have 21 in the lead lap. Any one of those 21 are still capable of winning this race. Let's take a look at how they stack up. Back in the ninth position, we just reviewed the first eight for you. And car number 44 is in ninth, Levante. Then in 10th is Rusty Wallace. Running 11th is car number 75. And the uh, driver of that car is Dave Marcus. Going in the 12th position now is Ricky Rudd. And 14th is Buddy Baker. Uh, 13th is Buddy Baker. 14th is Tommy Ellis. The 15th position is uh, now holding Ricky car Rudd. number 15, the Rudd car. And the Earnhardt car is in the 12th position. The 16th position is car number 52. With a change of drivers, Morgan Shepard is there now for the in injured Jimmy Means, injured down at uh, Charlotte. Going 17th is Greg Sachs. And the 18th position and in the lead lap is that youngster. That is uh, Bobby Hillen. And 19th, a lap down, is Bobby Allison's car number 22. In 20th, being two laps down, is car number 71 they're reporting. They're showing Allison a lap down in this report we just had from scoring. Now, I, I believe that's incorrect to right now. He had made a pit stop just a moment ago. In fact, he was lead. He stayed out on the track during this caution longer than most any others. Then he came in for a pit stop. So he should be still in the lead lap, but at the tail of the lead lap. So it's 19 instead of the 21. And, and you're, in the lead and you're lap. right. And they're just rechanging that and showing Allison now as the last car in that lead lap. And then back in 20th would be the Mike Alexander car. Let's see if we can get a word from Jeff Bodine now leading in the event. He has come from 28th position to be out in front. Question is, Jeff, do you think you can hang around and be there at the end of 188 laps? Jeff Bodine? Can yeah, I hear you. You think you can still be there first place when we get down to lap 188? Well, our car isn't strong enough to run out front, but uh, we can run with the lead cars in a draft. I'm sure I just reached our tail and uh, a few guys will go by me, but we're going to try to hook on and just stay up front. car seems to be running very well. It did not qualify that well, Jeff, but right now, the way you've been moving up through the traffic, it looks like it's handling just about as good as you could want. It is handled awful good. It, it's really beautiful. Harry Hyde's got this car to drive any place on a racetrack, and that's enabled me to go high or low and get up front. And, you know, we're just going to try to hang in there, and uh, hopefully we'll be around at the end of this race. Jeff, most of your past experience, winning experience, was on short tracks. How do you like running these 200-mile-an-hour laps? I love it. The ball out here, especially when your car's handling good. Uh, it's really a lot of fun, but... You've always got to remember just how fast you're going and, and try to keep your head about it. Don't get in trouble. Jeff Bodine in car number five, the leader, and you'll be with him when we come down for the restart shortly here this afternoon as okay. we are finishing in the fourth caution period of the day. What's going on? 360 degrees off our fire ladder camera. We worked the 138th lap, and we will have completed 367 miles, about 133 left to go. Heat sometimes is a factor at this race. Uh, has not been a factor here today. It's an ideal day for racing, particularly at Talladega in July. They're able to run the high speeds that we've been seeing here all day long. And also, the, the surprising, I should say, is that the attrition rate has been rather high. Uh, with the good conditions that we have here. It's overcast and the temperature is perhaps in the low 80s, uh, which is really good. But I guess the speeds that they're running out here today has helped to cause the attrition. You see the wind just wobbling from Tad as they come off that fourth turn. Kenny Reagan driving only his 23rd race in his whole career, running to that lead lap. He led one lap earlier today, first race he's ever led. Good, he consistent came, racer. He came here a couple of years ago, and the first race that he ever ran was here at Talladega. Now, Benny Parsons and I started on some of the dirt tracks before we started racing, and that's what's usually recommended. You don't go to the fastest racetrack in the world, but Kenny Reagan did it and, and did well at it. Another one of those people that believes in the old nothing to unlearn, that old line. Okay. Now, there's the leader. Yarborough is there at issue. Can he stay there? Last year, he stayed up there most of the way. Then he cracked the head on the car. He's finished second in this race twice. As you know, Ned a moment ago just mentioned that Kenny Reagan did, in fact, come here for his first race. And there has people that, that did do that and got away with it. But there's also other people that paid a supreme price for doing it. Because it does take a tremendous amount of experience to compete at these speeds. Well, it's so easy to drive this track, but I think the point Darrell Walter made earlier, this is a track that can bite me because if it happens, it happens so quickly. 
You don't rely on reactions, you have to rely on instinct here. There's Ken Reagan in the car number 77. He's been lying 17th over the past 15, 20 laps. He's a car dealer from over Unadilla, Georgia. Very nice fellow and uh, very determined young man. Talk about determination. Look at the squadron up in front. Now there's an enthusiast. You can tell by the hat who she's for. Well, we're in Alabama. Bobby Allison's in Alabama. Hey, those pictures of the grandstand give you an idea of what could be the newest aerobic exercise. You buy a seat in the grandstand and get up and down for 188 laps. Baker in the pits. And as he did earlier, came in before anyone else. He just simply is not getting the gas mileage. Some of the others are. Perhaps they'll be able to go uh, six, seven, or maybe as many as ten laps. Get to change the right side tire. Good pit stop. The Wood Brothers are among the best. Car number 28, Kaylee Yarborough coming around. It is car 51, Greg Sachs. In the back straightaway has lost an engine. And the caution is out. Amazingly, they'll be racing back to the flag as Kale Yarborough. Of course, it doesn't do a whole lot to leave this lap as they come back uh, to the front. They've all stepped out of it. That's the second time for Baker. He just pitted and then the caution comes out. But with the good work of caution, the, send Baker in. Yeah, I guess. The good work of the Wood Brothers did get him back out. He'll stay in the lead lap. A tough break for Greg Sachs, who'd run a super race here today. Kept himself up there in the lead pack. He's a rookie on this circuit. But to run this long and that hard, still in position to get himself a, a good finish or even perhaps a win. Anybody that's still in that lead lap is still a potential winner in this race. But now his hopes go up in smoke. Cecil Gordon, crew chief on car 51, a man who ran many races himself on this track. Greg Sachs, number 51. So we should see the leaders coming in now, and the activity will all be on pit road. Mike Joy will be standing by, changing tires. They put the hood yeah, down. That's surprising. We thought the engine blew with all that smoke, and that could have been a filter or something. It could have blown the oil line off or something like that, because they were looked like they were planning on fixing the car and going back on the racetrack. They leaders. were changing tires. Leaders coming in. This is happening in the 143rd lap. Here's Mike Joy. Ready to head to pit road, Waddell Wilson has four tires up for Cale Yarbrough. Now they look carefully at Baker's pit stop to see if he got four tires or just gas just as the caution came out. Cale stays a bit far out from the wall and they go to the right side first. Richard Bostick with the car up in the air, Joey Knuckles changing the right front tire. No chassis change, they have not changed the wedge on the chassis all day. Now everybody comes around, Bostick with that 65 pound jack and they will change the left side tires. Let's go to Chris Economaki. Well, this, this pit stop came at the right time to equalize this race. There's 37 laps to make 100 miles here. There's 43 laps to go. Unlikely that any car can get 43 laps on one tank of fuel. So now it's a brand new automobile race. It's like one of those basketball games with the scores 100 even with five minutes to go. They'll all have to make one more pit stop, and the pit crew could win or lose it for the drivers today. Back to you, Ken. Now we're down to it. Put prudence aside now. There's been some cars that's gotten awfully good gas mileage this year. They're pushing Bodine's car down pit road. He has some sort of a problem. He's been right up in the thick of the battle all day, but as we've seen several times here today after pit stop, they have problems as they go back out, but it seems to be in the firing of the engine this time, not in the, the drivetrain as we saw earlier. Apparently, he's got it to going. But the point I was about to make, Ken, wouldn't surprise me, depending on the length of this caution, we might see some or maybe all of them come back in just to top off the fuel tank for that extra lap or two that they might get. But Bobby Allison has got extremely good gas mileage on numerous occasions this year, and so has Phil Yarborough. If there's anybody that's going to make it all the way from here, I'd say it'd be one of those two. Or how about Travis Carter's cars? Travis was saying he was getting as much range as anyone on car 33, and if he thought it got to that kind of a contest, he could be in good shape. with you live at the Alabama International Motor Speedway inside Jeff Bodine's car. Jeff, what happened to you after you came off pit road that time, or as you came out of the pits? Yeah, we ran out of gas on that uh, front lap just before we entered the pits, and the car wouldn't start, and they had to push it. Uh, we're okay now, but it, it, it uh, just wouldn't start. It didn't have any gas. Boy, you talk about a caution coming at the right time. It did for you then, didn't it? Right, we were going to pit anyway that next lap, but uh, when we slowed down and got up on that banking, the uh, little fuel we had left uh, went away from the pickup and we ran out. Jeff, how do you feel about your chances at this point now? 
Well, the car's handling awful good. If we could just uh, avoid some trouble and, and just hang in there, I think we have a chance at a good finish. There's a lot of cars that are a lot faster and stronger than we are. We can't get out front and go, but uh, you never know on that last lap here at Talladega. Are you going to have to make another pit stop for fuel? Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. Jeff Bodine in car number five, currently running 15. Terry Labonte coming back on the track. Interesting circumstance on Travis Carter's car, the number 33, Benny. Travis has a fuel flow meter on Harry's car that tells how much liquid has went through this meter. In other words, Harry can sit there and watch the thing and tell when they've used 21 gallons of gas. And here, that's about all they can pick up would probably be 21 to 21 and a half gallons. So when he gets to 21, he tells him I'm coming in. Quite an innovation, it really is. I think Ron Bouchard is on pit road right now with some trouble, Kim. Car 47. Ron Bouchard still on pit road as the field is gathered up for a restart, and Bouchard's hopes in this race may be plummeting right here. Okay, well, he gets it to going, so he's going to remain in the lead lap. He's going to have to run hard to get the field, and then moving into turn three now, but we're still under caution, but the green's scheduled to come out when they come around this time. Actually, if he builds up ahead of steam down that back straightaway, it could be a little bit, bit of an advantage for him. It could be. He might be running... 190 miles an hour where they're accelerating from 75. Want to be very careful with a bowling ball like that at that speed. Now there you see the point standings. With Dale Earnhardt up in first, Bill Elliott is second, Labonte third, and Waltrip back in fourth place. But still not too far out of the lead. Uh, yeah, less than 100 points separating him from the lead, so it's a very tight battle as we get ready for a very tight race here. And Earnhardt will be in front with Bobby Allison, as you see in the white Number 22 in second spot. Third is Waltrip. Fourth is Kale. Fifth is Gant. Sixth is Elliott. Seventh is Speed. Eighth is Baker. On the restart. Here's Elliott. Watching the meters on Bill Elliott's car as they scramble. Holds up on Harry Gant. Counter climbing on it. That's not altitude. The fuel meter on that car. Yeah, he has one of those things down there too, Penny. That boys above Dahlonega, Georgia, surprised me with their knowledge. <laughs> there are no secrets that last more than 24 hours. That's exactly right. Yeah. Allison for the moment down low. That move by Gannon he scoots around. Strategy report as we see Earnhardt going back in front, and here comes Bodine. Bodine on the pit road, something to miss on car number five, and he's going right back to the garage area. Unfortunate situation for Jeff Bodine. Let me tell you what happens when you run out of fuel. At the RPMs that these engines are turning, when you run out of fuel, you instantly get air in there and no fuel, and you burn a piston. Uh, you just lift the top right off the piston because it gets so hot. Running out of fuel is the worst thing you can do to one of these engines. Had a driver replacement. Greg Sachs has replaced Ken Reagan in car 77. Reagan was overcome by fumes and he was groggy in the pit area, so Greg Sachs has taken over in car number 77. Strategy report. Here's Chris Economaki. Well, down along pit road, fuel again becomes the story. These are the men in Bobby Allison's pit with their little calculators and computers. Allison has been getting great gas mileage this year, and they say they think they can make it. They're going to try without another pit stop. Buddy Baker's pit crew says there's no way they can go 43 laps on one tank of gas. They know they're going to have to stop again. And Tommy Ellis and his crew, they're happy up there. They don't know whether they can make it or not, but they say they're going to try and let come what may, come what may. Back to you, Ken. 149 laps completed this time by of 188. 149, 396 miles down. There's Petty, still determined, still trying, well off the pace. Well, Bodine, we saw him coasting into the garage area, and Mike Joy is with him. Bodine in the garage area, not the place you wanted to end this afternoon. What happened? Engine let go. Uh, no, we're running so darn good. The car was handling great. Hi, everybody back home, Rick. But uh, you just let go on that restart. We ran out of gas. I don't know if we burned a piston when we ran out of gas and then it broke or, or what, but everything was going so good that, you know, it's really a shame. Boy, do you look hot. 
Not, not too bad, Mike. I was having a ball. The car handled so good. It drove so good I could go high or low. And I was just having a good time out there. And it isn't too hot. It's very comfortable. Uh, well, here we are. Well, he's won two short track races, Ken, but he'll get to luxuriate in the garage the rest of this afternoon. Dale Earnhardt, Kannapolis, North Carolina. Leads. Nine career wins. Will this be number 10? Waltrip into second, knocking on the door. First turn. Garbaro third. Earnhardt hasn't won so far in 1984, Ken, even though he's leading the points now. Here he is out of turn number two. Earnhardt, who won this race a year ago. The car has been getting stronger all the time. Ken, I'll tell you what, you're looking at a lot of cars, bumper to bumper, that can win this race, that has the car, that has the crew, that has the ability to win this race. And where the winner's going to come from is anybody's guess. Earnhardt first drove in this race in 1978. Will Cronkite and finished 12. Now he's leading. 150 laps have been completed. More in a moment. Averaging 196 miles an hour in the last lap, Dale Earnhardt stays in front. Buddy Baker has meandered up the third. Here he is coming to the inside, making a move. Baker down low, now pulls up and battles for first place, going into turn number one. Nearly 100,000 people on their feet, watching 16 drivers competing for first place. Ned, remember when you won the Southern 500 and you won it by 14 laps? My, how times have changed. They certainly have, Ken. It's unbelievable that you still have. And any one of these 16 cars, as Benny said earlier, are still capable of winning this race out here. And I think Benny said he finished second at Darlington one time with 12 or 13 laps down. I was 13 laps down. David Pearson won the race, and I was 13 laps down in second. Just doesn't happen anymore. Bumper to bumper, 200 mile per hour expressway action here at Talladega, Alabama, live today on CBS. Coming up next, the Greater Hartford golf action next on CBS. This crowd, just so appreciative of the tremendous effort by all of these great drivers. And Baker, with some of the wildest driving, is just eased up through. He really makes the others pay attention to what he's doing. Now, you even has put that car in some holes today that you wouldn't think it would go in, but the car has to be working perfectly for him to be able to do that. Now, Yarmer is going to move up and see if he can get draft away from the rest of the field, but Earnhardt's going to have different ideas. That's about right. Earnhardt saying, thank you very much. I'll have none of that. There's Earnhardt, blue and yellow car, number three, in third. Waltrip is in fourth, and Gant lies fifth cars in that lead draft, 16 cars in the lead lap as the Warpath moves to its 155th lap. 156 now complete of 188. 32 laps to go. Here is Mike Joy with a crew chief on Earnhardt's car. Well, Ken, the timing of that caution flag may have changed race end strategy, but maybe not for the better. Richard, did that caution come out a lap too early for Dale Earnhardt? Looks like it's going to be about three laps too early for us, you know, so we're going to fall back and try to use a little bit of the draft and see what it looks like toward the end of the race there now. Well, that'll improve your fuel economy, but can you gain three laps that way? Uh, I don't think so, but we're going, to, we're going to see what it looks like when we get down to the very end, you know. Boy, are they hoping for a caution flag count. One more before this race is over. Oh, car trouble. trouble. Here it got it. Benny, crashing. That is the Trevor Boyce car. In big trouble out of turn number four. It's a hard way to get a caution. That was not the way that Richard Childers wanted it. He's moving around. He just cut the switches off. He's coming out of the car after taking a ride like that, getting out that quickly. Another indication of how well these automobiles are put together because that was not an easy ride. You know, Ned, when he, when he reached up to turn the switches off, my first thought was he was trying to start the car to go again. You're watching it live here on CBS. Let's look at it in replay as to what happened to Trevor Boyce, who's been running right up there all afternoon. Okay, he gets hooked. It looks like that's Tommy Ellis car right behind him, and they just touch it up, and it shoots his car down to the inside. The air gets underneath the car, flips it over backwards. It hits hard on the top, scoots up the end of pit road there on the top. It hits the grass area, flips back over all the way over and back on the wheel and up on the side and land back on the wheels once again like a big bucking horse. Summer rodeo ride for Trevor Boyce of Calgary. 
you know, the, as the rodeo performer would say, he, he chose a good steed for that performance there, I'll tell you. Stopping to tie his shoe. Let's take a look and replay. This is, they're coming off of turn four. It looks like he drifts out just a little bit, Ken. Tommy Ellis on the outside of him there, and they hit just enough to send him around, and the air got underneath the car, sends it right upside down. Benny, what happens when that air gets under there? I don't know, Ned. I, just the know, pressure? At Daytona, this watching this action that we're seeing on the screen reminds me so much of the Ricky Rudd crash from Daytona in the Bush class that we had in February. But, you know, and they re they paved that section down in Daytona because they felt like that the cars coming off the pavement onto the dirt made the car bounce and therefore got air under the cars. That car never reached the grass before it flipped over. Right. So that destroys that thought that they had. They moved that wall back too, have they? They moved the wall back and they paved that entire area thinking that that was some of the problem. But as you notice, when uh, you think of the Randy LaJoy crash where he took that several others like Harry Gant several years ago, you see it. He, he was all ready for business, and I thought you were right. He was reaching around to see if he could get the thing fired. No, he was just turning it down. Oh, that's too bad for James Hilton as well as for Trevor Boyce. James Hilton, one of the really nice people. Here they are again. As they come off of that turn, he went up into the groove there and just clipped the front bumper of Tommy Ellis' car number four, and it doesn't take much at those kind of speeds. It shot him right down across the racetrack. That's Phil Parsons there doing a very heads-up piece of driving, got slowed down enough, and Ben, as you say, just as he got to the edge of the pavement, getting onto the grass is when he got airborne. Tommy doesn't have to look for trouble. Trouble finds him, I and mean, that car <laughs> just, just came up on him, and yeah, what are you going to do? Nowhere he could go. No, nothing he could do because there was cars right on his bumper and uh, in that heavy traffic. Too bad for a young fellow who had perhaps driven the best race of his career here today. Trevor Boyce had, had stayed right up there in the thick of the battle all afternoon long. Still in the lead left. Well, it's nice to... 160 laps will be completed, 188 this time by the start-finish line. Trevor Boyce has crashed. Let's go to Mike Joy. For sale, slightly used, one Winston Cup race car. Also doubles as lawnmower when it comes through the infield here. This car, the passenger compartment is completely intact due to the NASCAR safety rules. Trevor climbed out of this unscathed. But the rest of the car, well, it's headed for the junkyard, and it certainly leads the question with this potential, why do these fellas do this? As you watch a major incident unfold at 200 miles per hour, it leaves an indelible memory imprint. Those terrifying seconds when a driver's life is in the balance, they're not easily forgotten. So how is it that moments after something as frightening as this, that other drivers go about their business, a business which could tap them next with such seeming ease? It can't happen to me. Even though I can show you a few places and broke feet and ribs and cut places. But basically, uh, it always happens to the other fellow. And it's, and it's just part of the sport that I have never really, uh, really thought that much about. Bill Parsons, brother of former Daytona winner Benny Parsons, survived this terrifying series of spirals last May at Talladega, Alabama. And he never looked back. There's nothing like racing to me. It's in my blood. It's all I've ever wanted to do, and it's all I ever want to do. And I'm not going to let a little thing like a little crash take it out of me. For Brother Benny, it was a different story, briefly. I rode by, and the car was laying there on the roof, front burning. And I mean, that's probably one of the worst moments of my life. I mean, it really was. It was horrendous. I mean, I, I, I thought I was able, uh, I would be able to handle it. You know, I just thought I'd be able to handle it, but I couldn't. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, the top drivers mentally put it away. It's called racing attitude. On this level of the game, there is no room for any other attitude. We are back live. They have just taken the green flag. As they approach the first turn, they're coming back to full speed another time. Juan Bouchard of Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, the 1981 winner of the event is riding in first place as they go down into the back straightaway. In second place is car 75. And that is the day Marcus Carr, the man who won this race many years ago from the pole position, the only man to ever win it from the pole. And then comes Darrell Waltrip in third. We're live with you. 
at the Alabama International Motor Speedway. They will complete 162 of 188 laps this time by. And that uh, Jarrett, we now have 14 cars gathered up for the bench. And the strategy of the pit stop, the need for a pit stop for fuel has gone out the window. They can all go the distance now, so it is going to be some kind of a shootout right down to the end. The frenzied action is all right here on the high banks of the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Ron Bouchard up in front. That second spot now belongs to Darrell Waltrip. The only two-time winner of the event goes to the inside. He fires up into turn number three and goes to the lead, and Baker in the Ford comes with him. Baker has proven all afternoon that that Ford has what it takes to, to get up front and to be, run among the front runners here all afternoon. Now, Waltrip really, he shows the trim several different times, but now, as Danny said earlier, we're running for the for the roses now, the cash is on the line, so he'll show what he has. Across the line, Walter becomes the 16th different leader in the event. If more than 10 cars finish in the lead lap, that would be a record for this race. Looks like we're going to have it. There you see them. Out of two. Back for another time at first comes Baker, and with him comes Bouchard, and Walter is falling back. Walter made that move in the last lap of the International Race of Champions. You saw at the top of our program today that gave him the win and he came from fourth or fifth. Baker does not want to be in this position again because he lost in Daytona a couple of years being the leader and leading the race for the last 20 or 30 laps and Kill Yarborough slingshot by him. He does not want to be in front, but I really I think he felt like Darrell Walter was just a bit too slow for him, and he therefore he passed Darrell. Now you see Earnhardt in fourth, and you see Labonte up to fifth. Sometimes they'll make a pass of that sort, too, hoping that, that the car that they're bringing with them might just give them a good shot, that they might move out eight or ten car lengths and hopefully break the draft from the other cars back there. Since most of these cars have been running here all day long. I don't see that happening. They get four or five car lengths, like we see right there on Walton. But uh, I think they'll be able to pick that up and pick right back up through the front row. Bill Elliott's car that started outside of the front row back in 8th or ninth, right behind Kaylee Arborough. Straight away. Top 9 all together. Here's Bouchard riding right to Baker. Laps complete, 166 of 188 this time by. And there have been some awfully good finishes here at Talladega, Daytona, Charlotte, wherever. Last Sunday at Pocono, Pennsylvania, tremendous finish among three cars battling for the lead. But never in the history of the sport have we had this many cars running this strong, this near the end of the race. I think that we're going to be in for history. And all with full tanks. There's yeah. always been that fallout with pit stops and green flag conditions. That is not the case here. Well, certainly the fans don't want to go away. They better stay glued to their TV sets as these fans here just standing up. They haven't had much sitting time here this afternoon. They didn't really need these seats here today. You know, I was thinking of that a moment ago. They paid good money for those seats and didn't use them all day. They'll spend half an hour after just sitting in them trying to collect themselves. Baker, he's led what, 15 times that? 15 times for 27 laps, and that makes him the biggest leader in the event. Normally, the top winner, you know, he's going to lead half of the race. Beginning to switch the position. You can see Walker getting anxious. He comes up to third. Let's go to Chris Economac. Well, Ken, there's smiles up and down pit road here. All the mechanics and crew chiefs have done their work. They all say now that it's up to the driver. There's enough gas to go to the end. The tires are good, and it's a driver's going to win this race, not some piece of strategy or some work by a crew chief. And they're all sitting here relaxing, knowing that their man is capable of winning. Thank you, Ken. Third place car is now Waltrip, the man who's won it two times. Darrell Walter, can you be the first driver to win the Talladega 500 three times? Well, I've won it twice. I almost won it two other times. And uh, I don't know, last couple of years, uh, Ron Bouchard beat me at the start-finish line by uh, foot. And uh, last year, Earnhardt beat me at the start-finish line by about the same distance. So had a shot at winning both of those races and that would have given me four wins right now he's falling back 
Earnhardt pulling up. Yes, the car doesn't seem to be that strong. He, he got up in front there a moment ago, but he wasn't able to stay up there. As Benny pointed out, Becker wanted to get back in front of him because he didn't think Waltrip was leading him fast enough. Waltrip's able to stay in there in fourth place right now, but it just doesn't seem to have the muscle, Benny. He doesn't seem to have the muscle to stay up front with those good cars, with the Bakers, the Bouchards, and the Yarbroughs. You know, Kelly Yarbrough, the pole sitter, is back in the sixth or seventh spot right now, trying his best to get through traffic. But he's got six good cars, almost as fast as he right in front of him. He can't make it. 169 this time by. 15 cars in the lead lap. Bobby Hillen out of Midland, Texas, 20 years old, is still up here. 15 cars in the lead lap. He's the 15th. 14th right now is Ricky Rudd. And Tommy Ells, we've got an And there's a scattering. smoker down on the it's inside. like Arrington. Buddy Arrington. Chrysler. Going he gets it low on the racetrack. He no not caution, he's yes. putting anything out on the track, but he made a very smart move as the leaders were coming around on the outside. He got it down to the low side of the racetrack and now is coasting on around. They ran that last lap at well over 200 miles per hour. So they're what we say in, up in North Carolina, getting on with the getting on down there. 170 laps this time by will have been completed of the 188. There's the business end of the Talladega 500. Kyle Petty down on the inside. He's been running at reduced speed for some time now. He had an overheating problem early in the race. Lost the number last in the pit, so he's just trying to ride it out, get whatever points he gets. Nearly half a million dollars at stake. And the divvy gets pretty small after that first and second place with these fellows. He had these big high buck teams. Ricky Rudd's sister there. You know, that was... Uh, uh, one of the other uh, crew members that you thought was Carolyn, right? Uh, I was watching the race myself. They didn't pay attention to things like that. Car number 21, Baker stays there. Pouchard right on the rear bumper. He has run a good race. Here. Very good race. The car is oh, working is well down on the inside. Let's get a report on Trevor Boyce. I'm with Dr. Dave Fretz outside the Hardwick Care Center. How is Trevor? How is Trevor, boys? Uh, Trevor's fine. A uh, few bumps and bruises. He'll be sore tomorrow, but uh, no, no permanent problems. Apparently, Ken, he bumped the number four car, got the car a little bit sideways, and then it took off when it hit the grass. But Trevor's resting comfortably, and he's talking with his crew chief about going up to Canada to run a stock car race tomorrow. Buddy Arrington, you saw his car pull into the pits just as he left to join Mike Joy. Bouchard going for first place. Ron Bouchard back to first. Baker to second. Probably that's what Baker wants. And Bouchard might be testing whether going into turn three where he made that pass. Is that the place he can do it? Now he wants to see, can I stay out front until we get back to the start-finish line? Of course, there's going to be a lot, a lot of other things come into play with that many cars still running there at the end. This time he is going to be able to stay up front, but there'll be a lot of other jockeying going on behind him, and that could affect how he comes across the start-finish line. Bill Elliott back to eighth, now sweeps under. Bobby Allison closes up on car number 28. Kaylee Arborough, he continues to make his charge and try to win the Talladega 500. Continues to be a shuffle here. And Bill Elliott has pulled up into fourth. Meanwhile, a change for the lead. Buddy Baker is going back in front. Kaylee Arborough trying to pull beneath the car number three of Dale Earnhardt. And there lies number nine, Elliott, who's come from eighth up to fourth. Is there an ideal place to be when it comes down to the last few laps, Bill Elliott? It's hard to say, depending on how many cars are left in the lead lap, because that has always changed the situation. If there's only two cars left, being second more than likely is the place to be. But if there's possibly four or five cars left, leading the race may be where you need to be, because if you get all those other guys racing among themselves, you can possibly get out away from them the marbles. Elliott has been riding down on the inside Benny Parsons and seems to make that car work as well on the bottom side of the track as any car here. He has been as good on the inside as anyone. Terry Labonte just a moment ago passed several, several cars on the inside and went to second place. He's in the catbird seat right now, but the catbird seat keeps shifting every lap. Someone else has a different perspective at it. Now Ron Bichard has gone from first to 11th in the last two laps. The leader Baker. Second, Terry Labonte. Third is Earnhardt, who's been one dominating factor up in that front five. It has seemed to be Earnhardt, but he just hasn't had it to close. Playing it close, is that what he has? And there's Yarborough lined for him. All 
most touching out of turn two at over 200 miles an hour. It'll be 10 laps to go when they come back in, so everybody is trying to jockey now. They will be doing this for the next 10 laps, trying to get themselves in position. Now, Bill Elliott said it'd be different if you got four or five cars in the lead lap as to your strategy on that last lap. Nobody considered that they might be a full team number. 66 lead changes. One more will tie the record for this race held by, well, it goes back to the 1978 year when Lenny Pond won it. They had 67 lead changes. When we can tie it with one more lead change for this event, there is an overall record that's considerably higher based on the race back in May. Here's a report from Chris Economic. I just asked this man, Glenn Wood, how it looked for this driver in the lead. He gave me three words. He says, 28's are coming. <laughs> Dale Yarber used to drive for that man, Glenn Wood, and he knows how tenacious he can be at times, and he has seen that car run uh, so many times this year, as Benny Parsons mentioned at the top of the broadcast, it has been dominant in practically every race that it has run. Out of turn number four, back to the tri-oval another time. Baker is in himself a five-car length advantage. Earnhardt is in second, Kale is in third, Labonte is in fourth, Allison is in fifth, Lake Speed is in sixth, Waltrip is in seventh, Bill Elliott is following well back, and look at number four. Here comes Tommy Ellis out of Virginia, just doing a grand job in this McClure car, staying right in there. Harry Gant up in front of him, Ron Bouchard on his right flank. Out in front, it is still Baker. Baker draws away by five car lengths. Bill Elliott right there behind Tommy Ellis, who now puts the pedal down. He has done a great job of just hanging right up there with those leaders all day long. He's never had this much experience in running in the draft for that long of a period of time because he's never had a car that run this long. Sure not like running Langley Field. Here he is back to the tri-oval. Here's Chris Economaki. Well, we just asked and we saw Grover and the Buddy Baker's pit crew smiling. I said, what's so funny? He said, Buddy, just asked what to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's no help from down there at this point of the race, believe me. <laughs> you know, they got to see a thousand things going through their minds out there. They got to keep their mind on what they're doing, you know, while they're running at 200 miles an hour and not run over somebody or get too close to somebody and put themselves out of it. But they got to also be thinking, well, what am I going to do to get myself in position to win this race? Every one of them knows they're there, that they got the chance to win the race. The cars run fast enough, as Benny said earlier. They've got all the ingredients there, but just getting themselves in the right position as we get down right at the end of this race. Baker drawing away just a little bit here by about half a car length. Laps complete. They come down across the start finish line, sweeping past Kyle Petty coming out of the pistol. 181 complete of 188. Trying the bottom of the racetrack. Terry Labonte, number 44, the Billy Hagan car. Crew Chief Dale Inman goes into second place. The Waddell Wilson car. The Harry Rainier machine of Taylor Yarbrough lying fourth and sandwiching himself in there so neatly is Labonte. Now here he comes driving to the inside, and Earnhardt comes with him. I'll tell you, that looked strong when he pulled up coming off the turn two, slipped right up to about three cars, and then decided to go ahead and take the lead and did it and moved right out three or four car lengths in front. They may have Kill hung out to dry. No, he got back in. I thought maybe the, now they're going to pass the dominant car in the race. I thought was going to go. He's going on back. They got the 28 car going backwards. Allison pulls up. Bobby Allison becomes a factor once again as he goes to fourth. Baker lies third. Laps running down. And there are six to go. Six laps remaining. We're coming to you live from Talladega, Alabama. You are inside Bill Elliott's car as he begins to make his charge. Final moments of this race at 200 miles per hour. It's being decided. Terry Labonte out of Corpus Christi, Texas is now leading. Dale Earnhardt, former national champion, winner of this event a year ago in the second position. There's Earnhardt's wife, Teresa. She naturally is excited. She wants to see him win two, two in a row here at Talladega. Buddy Baker in that third spot. No one has ever won it back-to-back. -back. Only Waltrip has won it twice. Five to go as they reach the line. Terry Labonte. They have prepped this car for a considerable amount of time, getting it set for this race. Again, it was one of the most important races for them this year. Took some extra time. Will it pay off? 
Meanwhile, that Richard Childress car, the number three for Dale Earnhardt, that Chevrolet works in second place. I think he's sitting exactly where he wants to be right now, Ken. But he, he's also got to take into consideration that Buddy Baker sitting right there on his lap. I think Buddy is pretty well where he wants to be because he knows Earnhardt's going to make a move. And he figured he'll pick, when they get side by side, he'll pick the draft for both of them up. And he'll fill that position on the last lap and be able to draft fast where Earnhardt figures, well, those others back there are going to be racing with each other. That will slow them down. Here's Mike. Giovanni's got to be thinking the same thing. So. Here's Mike Joy. Four laps to go. Does Dale Earnhardt tell you he's in the spot where he wants to be? Do I, is he in the spot he wants to be, does he say? I don't know. We ain't talked lately. We just let him drive. He's driving as hard as he can right now, I'm sure. And they're counting the gas drop by drop. You guys may not make it. Or we'll make it now. We got the gas made. It's just... Depends on no telling who may win the race right now. It's, it's going to be an interesting finish. Crew's done their job. It's all up to the driver. Earnhardt looks low. Goes down to the bottom. Actually, he stayed stable in 44. Pulled up a little. Now here they are out of four. What about Allison Benny Parsons? Is he where he wants to be? Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think he's quite up as far as he'd like to be. Buddy Baker's spot, third spot. I think anybody would take that spot or Dale Earnhardt's. But any other spots than that, I don't think that's where they want to be. Do you then? Other than maybe Labonte, because he's got to know that, that Baker is going to make a move on Earnhardt, which might slow both of them down a little bit. So the front position might not be a bad position to be in. Other than those positions, I don't know. Kale is fifth. Back straight away. Bouchard has dropped off the pace. Ronnie Bouchard has dropped off the pace after a tremendous run today, Ken. Waltrip is sixth. Lake Speed is in seventh. Perry Gatt is in eighth. Ellis is in ninth. Bill Elliott back to 10th. Getting down to the finish. Show and tell time at the Alabama International Motor Speedway. That would be just a fraction over two five miles laps, to go. Two laps to go. Joining us for the Greater Hartford News. Two laps remaining here in Talladega, Alabama. Dale Inman, crew chief for Terry Labonte. Watching that slim lead, knowing that Earnhardt is getting ready to shoot his shot and here comes the field closing a record number of cars clustered together ready to fight it out at 200 miles an hour and harry gant on the inside the bandit in the hal need burt reynolds car number 33 begins to make his move low on the track he pulls alongside he's fighting with buddy baker now trying for third now that's one of the better things that can happen to those front two cars. Tommy Ellis trying to come up on the inside. They were on the radio trying to get Sarah Labonte to get out of the lead, but with all that jockeying going on behind him, he still might be in the best place to come around for the white flag. One lap to go. As this tremendous group of cars thunders into turn number one, Terry Labonte in front, Earnhardt is there in second. Then in third, it's Buddy Baker on the outside. Bobby Allison is in fourth. Harry Gatt is on the inside in fifth. At 200 miles an hour, all of these cars contesting for the lead. Earnhardt closes ground. He's going to try the high side. Earnhardt going to turn three at 200 miles an hour. Winds it up, fires it in there. And it's Earnhardt going in front. Baker to second, Labonte back to third. It is still Allison in fourth. And now on the inside, Terry Labonte begins to move. Labonte back to second as they switch positions and shuffle down out of the turn. Dale Great Earnhardt. for Earnhardt. They're racing for second back there. Open the door for Earnhardt. As they come out of the tri-oval, headed for the line. The question will be who will be second. The checkered flag belongs today to the Richard Childress crew. Dale Earnhardt has done it again. The first man to ever win it two years in a row. Dale Earnhardt proud on pit road, ecstatic as they've just done it. The first team to ever win the Talladega 500, two solid straight times. A brilliant maneuver by Earnhardt in the last moments of the race. It was a very brilliant move. Now, he drove Bud Moore's car to victory here a year ago, same sponsor, but Earnhardt has won in two different big cars. It's the Ford last year, a Chevrolet here this year. Let's take a look again as well, then, for second place as they come to the line. Here's Earnhardt, and as they began to struggle for second, it gave just a bit of an advantage to Dale Earnhardt, who had made his move on the outside, going to turn number three, broken away from the draft, and took himself to first place. And in for second place, hello. <laughs> it looked like Labonte. Labonte maybe just a few inches. 
So that's the story of the 1984 Talladega 500. This man, Dale Earnhardt, is successful. And the first man to ever win it two years back to back. For Ned Jarrett, Chris Economaki, and Mike Joy, this is Ken Squire saying so long from the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Very well confident that the car would run and do the job if we could just stay up in the thick of things. It was a pretty competitive race. Everybody wanted to be up one and two and three, and uh, you know we just kept running and uh, moving around and shuffling until we got to where we wanted to be and tried to stay there. Welcome back to NASCAR Classic. 94,000 fans were breathless as they witnessed the unleashing of a legend. Dale Earnhardt's last lap pass of Terry Labonte showcased his super speedway prowess that would make him the master of the draft for his entire career. Behind Earnhardt, the entire pack jockeyed for a last second run that resulted in a 10 car photo finish. No less than three camera angles were needed to determine the finishing order. This man, Dale Earnhardt, is successful. It's one of the best races I've ever been in, I can tell you that. And I guarantee you, every fan that watched it and uh, was here present, seen one of the best races you'll ever see in your life. Talladega races have always been super races like that. And even, you know, who cares if it's six cars or, or 46 cars in a pack? It's, Talladega finishes are always going to be that good. It's what made them so much fun to win. And Earnhardt was, was pretty great at, at uh, coming up with those last lap deals. In total, there were 68 lead changes among 16 drivers during the event. And by winning his 10th career race, Earnhardt silenced the critics forever. No one would ever question the Intimidator's on-track performance again. And for Richard Childress Racing, victory number one with Dale would never be forgotten. That was big, I mean, because we knew, we knew one was coming at that point. You know, we'd been close several times already, and, and uh, we knew that uh, it didn't take long uh, being around Earnhardt that you knew they were coming and uh, just weren't sure when and uh, that will always be special you know there's I don't know that it ranks any higher than any of the rest of them it's pretty dramatic by winning that race that told us how far we could go with our program we knew that that we could win a lot of races I think it's hard to pick the greatest because they ran in so many different eras although he didn't win as many races the schedule was different. There weren't as many races. I would have to say that Dale Earnhardt was the best I ever saw. For NASCAR Classics, I'm Matt Yoakum. Thanks for joining us for our look back at the 1984 Talladega 500. Boys, Dale Earnhardt has done it again.